it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. What the mass media offers is not popular art, but entertainment which is intended to be consumed like food, forgotten and replaced by a new dish. But what if a television show refuses to be replaced, as is the case in tonight's story? I'm a cast member in your favorite TV show, and I'm being held hostage. Right, I need to be quick before they figure out I'm not on set. So, sorry for the mistakes. I wrote everything below last night, and I'm posting it now on a throwaway phone on public Wi-Fi. It's been two days since I've taken the pill, so I'm feeling clear-headed enough. My name is Robin. I'm 25 years old, and I'm being held prisoner. Robin isn't my real name, but I'm going to change it for obvious reasons. I play a main character in a well-known TV show which is currently airing. You've probably seen it on one of the big networks or streaming services. Most of you will know my character, though. I'm not sure about me. I wouldn't say I'm A-list, but our show does have a lot of fans. Look, I'm writing this because I recently talked to a friend who's also going through this ordeal with me. Well, he's out of it most of the time, but there were slivers in conversations when he mentioned this website. He said this place is where people can tell stories, real or fake. You guys can either believe me or chalk what I'm going to tell you down to a glamorized fan fiction written by someone with an overactive imagination. Well, it's the best place for me to tell it. I can't get into trouble because, I guess, it's a story. This is the only place I can reach out to. Right, I'll start from the beginning. I'm going to change the names of the characters and cast members to remain anonymous so this can't be traced back to me. The character I play is called Katie Parker. I've been playing her for almost three years. Katie was my first real acting gig. I've been cast in movies and shows before, but Katie was my way into real fame. I've met some great people since then, and my castmates are like my second family. Katie was the reason I moved to LA and took a chance on what I thought would be a small role. The show wasn't expected to get so big, but... Before I knew it, I was attending press days and going to my first ever Teen Choice Awards and San Diego Comic Con. It was crazy and surreal. I could work with my best friends and earn money for doing what I loved. It all seemed like a dream come true. When it was, at least for the first few years, I loved the show. It was something I could believe in. I connected so well to Katie because she suffered with the same problems as me, anxiety and depression. The show from the start wanted to be different, and I respected that. It wanted to take elements from other TV dramas and mix them together, creating something brand new and innovative, and it worked. Our head writers were brothers, collaboratively working on the show. They were passionate about the plot and characters, especially Katie, and often let me have creative input, which allowed me to connect to my character properly, which made it easier to play her. If I'm honest, I felt like I was playing myself. Trouble arose when we finished season one. Again, we didn't know the show was going to go so well. Our writers had a perfect ending, which tied up all the loose ends. We'd already filmed it, and despite adoring Katie, I was happy with the ending. Part of me was praying for a season two, but we all collaboratively agreed our initial ending was great. I remember we all went out for a cast meal, and the subject came up. Season 2. We were all definitely hoping for one, and knew the writers had ideas if we were greenlit. At that point, I was practically high on the thought of another season. And who could have blamed me? Another 13 whole episodes to film with my best friends. It was the dream. And weeks later, we were commissioned for Season 2. I can't put into words how happy I was. I remember being at home when it was announced, and I screamed... I just screamed and screamed until my parents, who I was visiting at the time, asked me if I was okay. The next few months went by in a blur. I was blown away at how big our show had gotten. People came up to me at the airport, calling me Katie. It was crazy, like I was living this insane dream. Season two was different. Though I was expecting it, 
I did notice the writing had gotten lazy, though. Katie's storylines went from normal problems to progressively more bizarre plots that I could no longer relate to. It reached a point when Katie became a separate person altogether, and playing her started to make me feel uncomfortable. Our fans started to notice the deteriorating writing, and then our show began its downward spiral. The writers were writing for shock value instead of actual engaging plots. We were left baffled and couldn't say anything because we weren't allowed. At the end of season two, it only got more and more insane, which again made sense. The whole point of the show was to be different, but the writers took it to a whole other level. Season three is where everything kind of blew up in my face. I wasn't excited to be greenlit for another season. None of us were. The spark had gone, and the show was starting to gain attention for how crazy it had gotten. My friends and family started asking questions, and they urged me to quit. As far as they were concerned, the show was a joke. As were myself and the other cast members. We became a joke. People weren't laughing with us, they were laughing at us. The characters we'd worked so hard to make real, only for the writers to make them barely recognisable. It was infuriating, but I wasn't allowed to speak out. If I liked a post on Instagram which was making fun of the show, I get non-stop texts telling me to unlike it before the fans caught wind of my true feelings. Yes, I was contracted to defend it, so I did. In every interview I made sure to speak only good things about Katie, even when her character was as good as dead to me. I ignored the sceptical look on interviewers' faces when I told them how much I loved the show and characters, and made sure I smiled. We were told that so many times it was practically drilled into us. We had to smile. But I didn't want to smile. I knew our fans were wondering if I was okay, because in almost every photo I looked tired and fed up. The others were the same, and that thought kept me sane. For every nauseating question I'd be asked about Katie's sex life, we'd exchange discreet rolled eyes and secret smiles. Throughout the day, I kept getting the overwhelming urge to stand up and leave, and never go back. But I kept going, because part of me was still holding on to faith that the show would get better. I had fallen in love with it, after all. Plus, I was with my best friends. I didn't want to quit the show and leave them. Even if Katie, as well as the show itself, were emotionally draining me, we started season three like normal. And obviously this year it was different. Comic Con didn't happen because of the pandemic, though there were small press appearances with social distancing measures in place. I spent a lot of time with my family over the summer and didn't travel at all, so when it came to heading back to film after giving the go-ahead, I was excited to see the others. I knew the show was still a mess, but working with them was something I loved to do, regardless of bad writing. Things were different, however. I knew as soon as I arrived that the atmosphere in the writer's room was stifling. When I sat down, I almost felt suffocated. We'd already had script meetings on Zoom, and they seemed to go fine. But as soon as I stepped foot inside, something was wrong. The secondary cast members were absent, which already set off alarm bells in my head. Normally everyone was present for script read-throughs, so when it was just the five of us, surrounded by writers and crew members... I felt like I was in a lion's den. They were all stony-faced and I immediately thought I'd done something wrong. Our head writer, James Marley, was sitting at the head of the table, a long rectangle we all gathered around for our first in-person script read. His brother, Derek, was nowhere to be seen. I later found out that Derek had quit the show over so-called creative differences. Normally, everyone would be talking animatedly and laughing. But our writers were silent. My castmates sat around me, looking uncomfortable. The night before, we gathered at another cast member Noah's apartment. We talked about the show, and after exchanging stories about how absurd our characters had become, we agreed we'd leave if it got worse. The show was ruining any chance of a serious career for any of us. There were five of us that night, me and Noah, who plays my on-screen love interest on the show as well as Izzy, Rory, and Lana. They play three other main characters. Noah declared that, as a cast, we were done. 
If the writing continued to deteriorate, and I knew it would, we were going to leave together. Noah said he knew people who could easily get us out of the contract, so we thought we didn't have to worry about that, though I was still sceptical. Well, it seemed unlikely he'd know people high enough to take down TV executives, but I trusted him. We kept our decision to leave the show under wraps. If the writers and producers found out, we'd be in trouble. No matter how much I hated the show at that point, fans still loved it. They still loved Katie, and if we left, that meant them finding new cast members. I didn't want to upset anyone, especially our fans. But being there was driving me insane. I couldn't look at another script and let them ruin Katie even more. So, we were sitting around the writer's table, and I was sweating. Bad. I didn't know if I was getting sick or just anxious, but my hands were clammy around my script. Part of me wondered if somehow the writers had caught on to our pact. Though, that was crazy, right? It was just the five of us hanging out. I got my answer when James spoke up giving me a condescending nod across the table. His voice was no longer friendly, more of a growl. He asked me where I was planning on going when I left the show. I was speechless. Had one of the other cast members told him? I knew they wouldn't have, so how did he know? My heart was pounding and it no longer felt like a script read-through. It was an interrogation. Rory jumped up to go to the bathroom, no doubt to escape the awkwardness but he was ushered back to his seat. I should have noticed that. The way they manhandled my friend, shoving him back into his spot next to Izzy. Maybe then I might have realized that something was seriously wrong, that we needed to get the hell out of there. But I could feel a panic attack brewing. My heart was doing acrobatics, and I felt like I couldn't breathe, like all the breath had been sucked out from my lungs. I stared down at my script and read over the same highlighted line over and over again until my eyes were blurring with tears. I couldn't bring myself to look up and face him, which was crazy. James had always felt like a friend, so why was he acting like that? From the corner of my eye, Izzy was reaching over to comfort me, but James snapped at her, telling the girl to leave me alone. Noah looked like he was going to step in, but I somehow managed to coax words out from my throat. That was the moment I had a chance to leave. At least, I thought I did. The words were tangled in my throat, but I couldn't say them. I was too scared. So I told James I didn't know what he was talking about. It was all I could say. My throat was dry like sandpaper, and I felt like I was going to be sick. Instead of interrogating me further, he asked us to hand over our phones, which was like a kick in the gut. I used Instagram a lot to document long nights of filmings or hanging out with the others. It was harmful playing around. I didn't understand why he wanted them. Twisting around in my chair, I noticed the only door was blocked. The others noticed this too, but they just gave us some lame excuse, explaining it was so we could concentrate fully on the script. Bullshit, Noah had argued, but he was ignored. When we refused to give them our phones... Our contracts were brought up, and we were threatened. What with, I'm not sure. James spoke in such a convoluted way I couldn't understand what he was saying. But maybe that was the point. He sounded like he was talking in tongues, and went through each section of our contract with his vindictive smile. I don't think I'll ever get out of my head. He was triumphant, and looking around at my castmates, I knew we were fighting a losing battle. The threats worked. With every single person in that room against us, we stood down. We handed over our phones, and that was their first step in taking control of our lives. It sounds stupid that something as small as handing over your phone can change everything, but I had no idea what doing that would do. I let go of my one connection to our fans, as well as my family and friends. Initially, it was just small things that changed. We weren't allowed our phones, and our social medias were taken over. The passwords changed. I figured that was in case we went live and told everyone we were planning on leaving. I tried several times to try the forget-your-password trick, but the account had been set to a different email address. My manager was quiet, so I guess she was on their side. Though I'm not surprised, we 
she was good friends with James. Before they took my phone, I texted her that I wanted to leave, and she read it but didn't reply. So we were on our own with crumbling resources. But things weren't overly bad at that point. Despite knowing it was a bad idea to speak out, we planned to go to every media outlet we could think of and report them for threatening us, as well as giving us shady contracts. Lana argued that it was impossible, that it would be our word against theirs, but Noah was insistent. He said if we made it public then the fans would side with us. I believed him. Our fans are passionate about the show, so I crossed my fingers. Weeks went by, and I started to notice a change on set, even if I was expecting it. All the following script read-throughs had been painfully awkward. It wasn't just the phone thing, as well as getting our socials hijacked, and I felt like I was being forced to play this character now. Set life was no longer fun. It was draining, and all I seemed to get was passive-aggressive smiles from crew members I knew hated me. It's weird. It's like James had cast a spell across set, making sure everyone I walked past sneered at me or made some backhanded comment about the five of us being difficult. I used to be friendly with them. I used to share my lunch with them and make jokes. But I found myself avoiding them now at all costs. I hid away in my trailer a lot. With no phone and laptop, which they also took away, I was bored. So I read books in between shoots. I used to visit the others, but they always separated us, making sure we couldn't talk to each other. I wanted to see Izzy. She'd be trapped in hair and makeup, and the boys would be on set. I tried multiple times to talk to secondary cast members, and sure, they nodded and smiled, but it's like they weren't listening to me. Like my words were going in one ear and straight out the other. The crew knew we didn't want to be there, so they treated us differently. Even if we happened to be the main cast. Well, it was discreet, so no other cast members caught on, but it was the type of low-key bullying that I'd seen at high school. They'd talk behind my back, or even in front of my face, trying to gaslight me into thinking I was the one in the wrong. But I was some spoiled brat who was throwing a fit because the show wasn't going the way I wanted. I decided... I was going to quit, regardless of what James threatened us with. I didn't care anymore. I just wanted to go home and forget everything. Forget the show and Katie, like it was all a bad dream. The others were going to come with me. Rory's the youngest out of us. He's from England, so he and the others were going to stay at my parents for a while. At least until we figured things out. I hadn't told my parents yet, but they knew I was heading over for Thanksgiving, which was only a few months away. I knew they'd be fine with extra guests. Well, they've met my castmates before, and I knew they were happy to self-isolate at my parents' house. Better than staying. And so, the five of us figured out a plan. We decided to go to a well-known entertainment tabloid and tell them everything, including the mistreatment and threats. When it was out there, broadcast, we would be free. At least, that's what I thought. I remember that day being boiling hot. There was no breeze and the humidity made my skin crawl. The air was dry and on our usual ten-hour shoot, I was barely keeping it together. I had to wear a thick sweater in ninety-degree heat and I felt like I was going to pass out. I was thirsty but was rarely allowed to have a drink of water, despite my voice croaking. After the shoot, I was anticipating finally being able to tell our story. It was driving me nuts being on set feeling judgmental eyes on me. Being general assholes was something I thought I could deal with one more time, but refusing to let me drink water was just cruel and petty. It wasn't just me. The crew made sure to make all of our lives a misery. Izzy was fat-shamed in front of everyone. James told her to lose weight, or her character would start losing sexual appeal. They gave her smaller-sized dresses during fittings and chastised her when she couldn't fit into a skirt. Izzy didn't fight back, she just stood there and took the abuse, nodding in all the right places. She tearfully agreed that she needed to go on a diet. So, enough was enough. We were going to expose the show and get our lives back. I was no longer scared I was overreacting or paranoid. It was clear the show only cared about the characters. Katie was like gold to them, and I was nothing. 
The night we were going to start putting our plan into action, I felt sick with nerves. I got changed at the end of the shoot and grabbed my stuff, heading out to meet the others. The night prior, Noah said he was going to use a friend's Instagram account to reach out to the tabloid. I know what you're thinking. We could have easily gotten a new phone each, but it's our accounts that labelled us official. If we made new ones, they'd be taken down. We spend all day on set, so it's easier for them to keep tabs on us. But Noah managed to get in touch with a friend. He didn't say the details, just that he needed a verified account. Even if they didn't believe us, we would definitely be headline news. Heading out to the parking lot, I expected to see the usual. Noah and Rory sitting on the far wall, feet dangling, sharing a cigarette between them, and Lana and Izzy talking quietly together. Our usual routine was to get an Uber back to the apartment building. Since they took our phones, the show usually got us a ride. But that night, there was no sign of the others. I figured I'd wait for them. It wasn't out of the line of possibility that they were all still on set. It was a cool night, so I paced the parking lot. Without my phone to listen to music, I was bored. My legs were aching. I was in a daze, thinking at the best and worst case scenarios of our plan in my mind. That's when I heard footsteps. I turned around with a smile, expecting to see my castmates. I hadn't gotten a proper chance to speak to them all day, so I was itching to just talk to them and go over the plan. On set, they were the only people who made me feel safe and kept my sanity in check. Except, it wasn't them. Instead of my four friends, I was staring at James. His smile was nauseating, but I forced myself to greet him. Robin, he said, and gave me a curt nod. I smiled back, hoping a simple greeting would send him away, but he seemed overly happy about something. His eyes were glittering, a smirk pulling at his lips. James commented about the weather, and I nodded along, hoping he'd go away, hoping the others would appear. But they didn't. They were nowhere to be seen, and I was starting to realise they weren't coming. And from the look on his face, he knew I was panicking. My hands were jittering, so I shoved them in my jean pockets. He stayed silent for a whole minute, and I was sure I was going to pass out. I was convinced he was doing it on purpose. Are you waiting for an Uber? He asked. James didn't lose his smile. I told him I was, and he started laughing, like I just told him a joke. I didn't call one tonight, he said. My stomach twisted. What? James smiled, but there was no warmth in it. He shook his head like I was a child acting out. You'll be staying somewhere else tonight. We've made alternative arrangements. He said it cheerily, but there was something in his tone which told me I had no choice. And I didn't. My parents lived 3,000 miles away. I had no phone and my castmates had disappeared. I found myself nodding, even when burning bile was crawling at my throat. I wanted to ask where the others were, but James didn't seem inclined to tell me. The writer told me to grab my stuff which was just my bag and jacket, and follow him to his car. I did, swallowing the urge to ask him where the others were. My heart was stampeding in my chest, and my mind was in overdrive. Did I start crying out for help? No, that's ridiculous. Anyone else would perceive what was happening as completely normal. James was giving me a ride to these so-called alternative arrangements, but I knew something wasn't right. It wasn't helping that I still had no idea where my castmates were. We'd gone over every possible obstacle, every chance of something going wrong, whether it was big or small. All day we'd communicated through nods and winks, silently sealing the deal. It didn't make sense that they would just disappear. The second I jumped into the back seat of his car, I knew James was aware of our plan, and he would stop at nothing to keep our mouths shut. The car ride was short, and I remember trying to figure out a way to dive out when he stopped the car and just run for it. I had a $20 note in my pocket. That's it. I'd left the rest of my belongings, like my credit card and purse, at home. 
The twenty was originally for something to eat, but I was barely allowed a break between shoots. Grasping the money in my fist, I knew the twenty would get me a cab fare to the city centre. From there, I go to the police station and tell them everything. The area where we film is fairly remote, and I quickly realised James was going in an opposite direction to the city centre. I started to panic, especially when he sent me knowing glances through the mirror. He knew exactly where the other cast members were, and seeing me squirm was giving him a sickening satisfaction. The others, I finally managed to choke out when I twisted in my seat and saw only darkness through the window. There were barely any streetlights, and I couldn't stop myself. It was like word vomit. Where are they? James didn't answer for a moment, and when I was sure I was going to throw up, he chuckled. You're shaking. His voice was like splintered ice. I don't know why you're sitting there acting like I'm driving you to your death. Put yourself together. Gaining confidence, I sat up straight. Where are you taking me? I asked in a steady voice. Where are the others? Others? James switched on the radio and cranked it up, swaying in his seat to a slow song crackling through the speakers. He was playing mind games. Yes, the others, I said sharply. What did you do to them? His gaze didn't leave the road. They're uh, sick, he murmured. Well, not the virus, I'm sure of it. The disease is inside their head, and I've sent them away to get better. Something cold slithered down my spine. Sick? My brain whirred with questions. What disease? What was he talking about? Yes. He tapped the steering wheel and my head started to pound. My cheeks felt like they were burning. Maybe I was sick. My stomach had been galloping all day. Like you, Robin. The five of you have been showing symptoms all week. But we figured tonight would be the best time to send you to a place where you can get better. Symptoms? Was all I could say with the gutter of my throat. What symptoms? Don't you worry about that right now, Robin. He hummed. We're going to make you better. After all, we can't have you spewing your rambling delusions online, can we? Before I could speak, he continued. His fingers were turning white and gripping the steering wheel. It's okay, Robin. We're going to help you. You don't want to embarrass yourself. No. I wanted to scream at him, but I felt like I was paralyzed. He was making out like I was crazy, like we were all crazy for wanting to leave the show. All of this because of a TV show. All because of Katie. That's all he wanted. James wanted Katie. I didn't cry. Crying would look pathetic. Crying would only add fuel to his fire that I was crazy. I want to go home. The words were out of my mouth before I could stop them. I felt like a child. But I was scared. I was so fucking scared. James didn't reply after that, and I was left to my thoughts. My plan to make a run for it had fallen through. We were in the middle of nowhere. There was no way I could find a cab at this time of night, and I had no phone, no way to contact anyone. When James parked outside what looked like a run-down hotel, I pressed my face against the window, considering using my bag as a makeshift weapon. The place loomed over me, a silhouette of a dark building. The only light was a sign on the front, the name written in neon purple cursive. I was ushered out of the car before I could try and attempt to break away. James kept a firm hold on my arm. When I tugged it, telling him to let me go, he assured me it was for my own safety, so I didn't hurt myself. I asked questions, but they were all ignored. The hotel reception wasn't much of anything, a small room with bright yellow walls and a sitting area where, ironically, reruns of our show were playing. A tired-looking man in a suit behind a desk fell into conversation with James. I tried to listen in, but they spoke in hissed whispers I could barely understand. I heard our names, all five of us, 
After ten minutes of me dazedly watching my character Katie run through a forest, chased by a man in a mask, James grabbed my shoulder and pulled me towards a set of brown mahogany doors, and then up carpeted stairs. The place looked abandoned, like we were the only ones inside. I was taken up three flights of stairs and pulled down a narrow hallway with the same sickly yellow paint peeling off the walls. I was shoved inside the first room, and before I could turn around and try and dive past him, James was slamming the door in my face. The sound of a lock clicking into place sent my heart into my throat. The room was tiny and box-like, with the same paintwork. There were two single beds, and sitting on one of them was Rory. He'd previously had his head planted in his lap and looked up sharply. His eyes were swollen. He'd been crying. Robs! We hugged. I asked him what the hell was going on. He had no idea. James had taken him and the others before me. When I asked where Noah, Izzy and Lana were, he shook his head with a frown. No clue. His accent felt warm and familiar. Something I needed. Rory then explained that James had told him and the others the same thing, that they were sick and needed help. He also said the windows were locked and the phone on the bedside cupboard had been disconnected. There was no way we could reach the outside world. That night, I slept. The bed was small and I could barely fit on it, but I was so tired I didn't care. I don't know how I managed to fall asleep, though. I was exhausted from the shoot, but my brain wouldn't shut up. And James's words played like a stuck record in my head. Before I knew it, the windows were flooded with sunlight, and Rory was standing over me, shaking me. I got up quickly, only to find James standing in the doorway. In his hands were two glasses of water. Rory made sure to greet him with verbal abuse, which I was thankful for. I was barely awake and couldn't string two words together. Colourful, James said, smirking at my castmate. The boy was practically vibrating with fury next to me. Though I'm not surprised. Rory has ADHD, so he's prone to flying off the handle. I'm here to take you to set. James looked fresh in a brand new suit, while we were in yesterday's sweats. Must have seen my expression. Oh no, don't you worry. I've got clothes ready downstairs, and breakfast is on its way. I've ordered McDonald's. My mouth watered at the thought of food after barely eating anything the day before. Oh, uh, before I forget, it's mandatory that you both take these. Setting the glasses of water on the bedside table, James pulled something out of his pocket. Holding it up to the light, I squinted. It was a tiny blue pill. Whatever appetite I garnered at the thought of breakfast bled away, and my chest tightened. For your, uh, condition he said, when none of us moved. Rory sputtered, breaking the silence. You're kidding, right? James shook his head, maintaining a wide smile. It's for your health. Take the pill voluntarily, or we'll have to take some appropriate measures. He strode over to Rory and dropped the pill into the boy's hand, and then mine. This time his eyes were hard. Take it. We had no choice. With James stood there watching us intently, I gave in and popped the pill into my mouth, taking a sip of water. It didn't taste of anything, and I had to swallow twice because it got lodged in the back of my throat. After a moment, Rory took his too. Neither of us wanted to, but, but it was either we did so, or James was true to his word and enforced appropriate measures, which I was sure was going to be him forcing it down our throat. After we took the pill, I expected side effects, but nothing happened. It wasn't until I was on set when I started feeling weird. I can't explain it. I've been on mental health meds before, and I know the side effects can make you tired and dazed. I felt similar to that, but a lot worse. It was like being in a trance. The hours of the day blurred together, and I could barely remember talking to anyone, or the conversations I'd had. It was a mess in my head. Even now, after two days of not taking it, my head still feels foggy. Though I did notice one thing. Through the fog, a coherent thought began to bloom inside my mind. Noah wasn't on set. He wasn't anywhere. 
I'd seen Izzy and Lana, but I can't remember talking to them. This is their way of shutting us up and stopping us from leaving the show. Drugging us heavily. Two days ago, James came in with the same pill. Rory took his like normal. And I hid mine under my tongue and fake swallowing it. James fell for it, and my head is starting to clear up now. I've seen the effects of the pill on Rory, though. It turns us into zombies. Rory still talks to me, but most of the time it's senseless rambling that, well, makes no sense. He told me to post on here, though, and so I am. Noah is still missing, but I know if I ask about him, they'll know I'm sober. They'll know I'm not taking the pill. Oh, I'm not risking it. I'm going to clear my head completely, and then find Noah. Well, I managed to get this phone from the prop department. They have a bag of old and new iPhones. Well, there's no cellular service, though. I can only get Wi-Fi. Look, if I can, I'll update you in a few days. I'm waiting for the pill to completely wear off. I need to think straight. I need to find Noah and get us all the hell out of here. Part 2. There's something wrong with my castmates. When I was clear-headed enough to think straight, it was the first thing I tried, getting Rory to stop taking the pills. But Rory is past saving. He'd been taking it for a while before I snapped out of it, so telling him to stop was like talking to a brick wall. He just looked at me with glassy eyes, and I knew his mind was too far gone. Besides, I know it's cruel to say, and I hate myself for saying this, if Rory was awake, if he was even semi-conscious to what James is doing to us, he wouldn't be able to stay quiet. He wouldn't be able to hide under a facade, faking taking the pill. No, he would go crazy. I know Rory more than he knows himself. He would attack James and give himself away. And right now, I don't need that. I need to figure out what the hell is wrong with my castmates and get us out of here. Rory is a liability. Him being out of it right now is killing me, but I've got a better chance of getting us out if I work alone. Right now, I don't know the day or the time. It's dark outside, so I guess it's night. Well, I know I've lost days, but I don't know how many. All of my days blur into one, and sometimes I swear they drug me despite me not taking the pill. It must be the food. That's why my head is foggy. My memory's spotty. I've lost all sense of reality and time, and right now, you're all I have. The phone I'm using is stuck on January 1st, so I have no idea what date it is. I don't know how long it's been since I first wrote. All I have is a stream of vague memories which don't make sense to me. I feel like I've been on autopilot, my body and brain working for me while I hang suspended, unable to speak or cry out. It's weird, like an out-of-body experience, like I'm paralysed, watching another me take over. Well, it was like that until I woke up this morning, my head clear and my thoughts mine again. I've stayed under the radar most of the day, pretending to be in a trance like the others. Now I'm alone, I can finally tell you what's been going on. We were filming last night, all week in fact. Now that's something I do remember. I know my filming schedule in clarity. I know our call times well enough to say I'm off the top of my head. Well, that's it. I mean, anything regarding my life, anything offset, is totally blank. All I can remember are Katie's lines. Katie's life. I'm 25 years old and yet all I know is the life of a 17-year-old detective. She's stuck inside my head and no matter what I do, I can't get her out. My brain feels like it's trudging through maple syrup, struggling to reach cohesive thoughts. My thoughts. Me. Robin. Instead, it's all Katie. Katie Parker, my freaking character. All I can think about is Katie, and I'm scared that I'm losing myself to her. I'm scared we're all losing ourselves. Now, I know something. I'm not sure when it was. It could have been yesterday or a week ago, but I know what I saw. And I know they tried to make me forget. I'll try and explain it the best I can, so prepare for a um, confusing stream of consciousness, which is me writing everything I can remember that happened beforehand. Sorry, my hands are shaking. I'm 
going to try and tell you everything, but bear with me. I still feel weird. My ears feel like they've been stuffed with cotton wool. I'm thirsty, but if I drink anything, I know I'll be sick. I have to keep pressing backspace because I can't type properly. I'll try to get out of this room, but I'm sealed in. The windows are locked. The only way in and out is the door, which is unlocked by a keycard only James and his guards have. I'm going to write everything out that I remember. My last clear memory is the day after I was taken prisoner. It was a Saturday, but we were due on set to do some reshoots. I was late getting out of bed. My head hurt and I didn't want to face the day. I didn't want to slip back into a reality where I was being held against my will and told I was sick because I wanted to leave the TV show I was sure had crashed and burnt. I was teetering on the edge of slumber when James burst in. Good morning. Rory, who was fast asleep on the bed next to mine, mumbled something in his sleep. His English accent was enough to put a smile on my face, regardless of that situation. It was strange having him as a sort of roommate. I mean, we were good friends, but he was more likely to hang out with Noah than me. Rory had a loud personality, and liked to play music well into the night, with Noah and the others, while I preferred a girl's night in with Izzy and Lana. Rory, on the pill, though, was a different person. Like he'd been body-snatched. He wandered around the room like he was in a dream, foggy eyes and a small smile curled on his lips. If I wanted to get anything comprehensible from him, it would either be late night or early morning when the pill had worn off. But even then, it was like talking to myself. He rarely spoke. I tried to speak to him the night before, but it was useless. Even if he wasn't in a trance, he still struggled to focus on me. When I said his name, he'd sit up and frown at me like I was a stranger, before lying back down forgetting I existed. If he wasn't sleeping, he lay on his back and stared at the ceiling with wide eyes, as if the sickly yellow wallpaper peeling away had the answers to the universe. Guys, James said with more vigour when none of us responded. When I sat up, trying to blink the sleep from my eyes, James was standing in the doorway, that same triumphant smile plastered on his face. I've won, his expression screamed. I've won and you've lost. Now in his hands were the usual, two glasses of water and a bag of McDonald's breakfast sandwiches. My mouth watered and my meals were kept scarce. I was allowed two a day and was monitored when grabbing a snack from craft services. Breakfast time, James trilled. His voice might as well have been nails scraping a chalkboard. We've got a busy day ahead, so I expect your best behaviour. Oh, my blood boiled. As much as I wanted to fight back, I couldn't. I couldn't let him know that I was fully sober. So I did as I was told and got out of bed, stationing myself next to Rory, who sat up wide-eyed and slipped off his bed on cue when James cleared his throat. Rory didn't look completely out of it that morning. He shot James a look of disgust when the writer handed him the pill. But he didn't say anything, only swallowing it down with a gulp of water, before handing the glass back, his eyes narrowed into slits. I wasn't sure if my castmate was struggling to stay awake or was glaring. Well, I hoped for the latter. James nodded, satisfied. Open, he murmured, and Rory looked like he might hesitate. It was then when I knew he wasn't all fully there. That would have been the point when he'd launch his fist into James's jaw before grabbing my hand and making a run for it, regardless of the guards. Now, it's been pointed out he's just like his character. Reckless, a lovable idiot who'd do anything to save his friends. Rory was his character to a T. But, instead of lashing out, he'd just stare back at the writer. His lips curled as if he wanted to say something, but his words were being suppressed, choked to the back of his throat. The writer cocked his head, a frown curving on his lips. Do you not hear me, Rory? Are you suffering from hearing loss as well? Rory shook his head in response, the movement almost robotic, before opening his mouth and sticking his tongue out, showing he had swallowed the pill. It was the kind of behaviour I would expect from a kid, and sure, Rory was only twenty, and the youngest out of the five of us, but James was treating him like a five-year-old who was acting out. 
My castmate didn't speak, only bowed his head, and James moved on to me. I took the pill as instructed, popping it into my mouth and shoving it behind my bottom teeth with my tongue. It wasn't the perfect hiding place, and it took practice to lodge the pill where it couldn't be detected, but so far I'd managed to fool him. James handed me the glass of water, and I took a small sip, making sure to swallow hard to emphasize the capsule going down my throat. James leaned in close, and I could smell bacon on his breath, which turned my gut. With every ounce of willpower, I kept a poker face. Open! His tone was commanding. I complied and opened my mouth. He did his usual check, and I struggled to remain still and submissive. With him so close, I had the opportunity to smash my head into his mouth. It wouldn't do much, maybe stun him, but it would give us the time we needed to run. And then what? <laughs> the thought struck me. Izzy, Lana, and Noah were still trapped. If we did get out, who'd believe us? Nobody, I concluded, my eyes starting to sting. Now they'd agree with James that we had lost our minds. The show was already a mess, and its stars had finally hit rock bottom. Oh, I could see the headlines, images of our faces popping up everywhere. The cast of the show had lost their goddamn minds and needed to be locked up. Though, of course, the show would respond by saying we'd been sent to some rehab center in the middle of nowhere, where we could escape the dangers of social media and find ourselves. Which was bullshit. I mean, even if we were sick, our minds truly fucked up by the state of our show... Then this place, this shabby hotel on the edge of wherever, it's not a treatment centre, it's a prison to keep us until we learn to keep our mouths shut, or miraculously decide to stay on the show of our own free will. Good girl, James said before gesturing to the food he'd set on the table. You two should eat, get washed and dressed, and be ready in fifteen minutes. You've got Katie and Maxine's to do today. James hurried out quickly shooting us both a two-fingered salute. As soon as the door slammed shut, I spat the pill onto my hand and grabbed the glass of water, eager to get the metallic taste out of my mouth. James had left us a bacon sandwich and a medium-sized Coke each. I ate the sandwich and dropped the pill in the soda, letting it disintegrate. Rory gave me a questioning look, but he didn't speak. The pill silences us, so Rory stayed quiet though I felt his eyes following me as I hurried to get ready. I took a quick shower in the small ensuite provided, and dressed quickly, throwing a sweater over some jeans and dragging a comb through the tangles of my hair. My appearance didn't bother me. That's what the makeup artists were for, ready to turn me into Katie Parker for the day. Looking at myself in the tiny mirror inside the ensuite, I couldn't help notice the shadows under my eyes and half wondered if there was anyone talented enough to transform me into the sweet-smiling teenage girl I was supposed to be. Oh, the ride to set was silent. There was still no sign of Noah, and I was starting to inwardly panic. I sat in the back of James's car, squashed between Lana and Izzy, with Rory in the passenger seat. They didn't speak a word, all adapting the same glassy-eyed look. I copied them. James nodded along to the radio, often asking us if he wanted to request a song. I spent the car ride staring out of the windows, wondering if there was some way I could knock out James and get control of the wheel. But of course, there were consequences. If I failed, we'd crash. There was nothing discernible to use as a weapon, and if I missed him, I'd reveal myself to be awake. But that didn't stop me thinking of possible positives to the negatives. If we crashed, we could get someone's attention, and I could easily get a hold of the police. Except, was I willing to put my friends' lives at risk to maybe get help? Knowing the answer to that, I ignored the sick feeling in my gut and focused on a plan which was slowly piecing itself together in my head. Noah was nowhere to be seen, so finding him was my top priority. I needed to get back to the hotel so I could look for him, which meant I needed a distraction. Our director, Simon, has emetophobia, the fear of vomiting, so I was going to use that to my advantage. We arrived on set early, and I spent an hour in hair and makeup, being turned into Katie. I had scenes with Izzy that morning, and usually I'd go to her trailer and rehearse with her. But because of the new rules, however, we had to stay separated, so I headed to craft services to grab a snack. 
My plan was to stuff as much food in my mouth as possible without it being obvious, and then pretending to bath when the cameras were rolling. Luckily, our producers like to spoil the crew, so I filled my mouth with caviar and hummus before heading to set. I was confident. I don't know why I was confident when my best friend was standing in front of me, her strawberry blonde hair pulled into a prim ponytail, made up eyes blinking at me. I tried not to notice the fog in her eyes, the look of confusion I'd seen in Rory's. She played Stella, Katie's best friend. Izzy would usually do voice exercises or get the giggles before filming, but not anymore. Uh, my castmate stared back at me, and all I saw was Stella's smile, Stella's teasing eyes. A shiver slid down my spine. The combination of caviar and hummus in my mouth turned sour. It slowly began to dawn on me that Izzy no longer recognized me. The pill we were being fed didn't just suppress and silence us. It rotted away who we were, leaving a submissive shell behind. Action, the director yelled, but his voice sounded faded. I couldn't take my eyes off Izzy. I couldn't stop thinking about the way Rory had been looking at me. Like I was a stranger. Burning bile crawled up my throat and I bent over, spitting out the contents of my mouth. Though I wasn't acting, I felt like I was really going to be sick and had to clamp my mouth shut to avoid actually barfing. The director yelled out and exasperated, Cut! And James hurried over, shoving Izzy out of the way. What is it? He hissed in my face, his expression thunderous. Are you sick, Robin? Why didn't you say anything? Part of me was waiting for Izzy to say something like she always did. When I looked up at her, she still had Stella's smile, her warm brown eyes staring straight through me. I could have cried, but instead I forced my emotions deep, deep down. The crew were murmuring behind me. I felt their eyes burning into my back. It wasn't cold, not in the full sunshine, but I was shivering. Keeping my expression nonchalant, I nodded to his first question, and with a heavy sigh, the writer nodded, pursing his lips. He straightened up, addressing the crew. We can do Katie's scenes later. Let's focus on Max, Stella, and Jules. James grabbed my arm, his leech-like grip eliciting a shriek in the back of my throat. I swallowed it down. Someone get Robin home, and for goodness sake, get her a Sprite or something. Poor girl looks like she's going to barf again. Are you going to be sick again, or are you finished? His tone was patronizing, and my cheeks burned with humiliation. I had half a mind to spit in his face. No, I said softly, making sure my voice was monotone like Rory's. Inclining his head, James nodded. Do you have a fever? Are you feeling hot? No. James let go of me like I really was contagious. Give her a COVID test just in case. He turned to the crew, running a hand through his hair. Or maybe I gave her a too strong dose of the first stage of her treatment. She may have had a bad reaction. I should have been concentrating on keeping my expression blank, but my heart was racing. First stage of treatment, my mind parroted. What did that mean? What was the second stage? As if I was still doped up on the pill, the world seemed to move in a blur around me. I was conscious of changing out of Katie's wardrobe and back into my comfy sweats. There were voices around me, but compared to the ones inside my head, they were white noise. All I could think about were Izzy and Noah and Rory, and what James had said about our so-called treatment. If the pill was the first stage, what was the second? My stomach slithered into my toes. Whatever James was drugging us with had turned my castmates into zombies. If the show wasn't satisfied with that, what were they planning on doing to us next? When time caught up, James was shoving me into the back of his car, dropping a lukewarm can of Sprite on my knee. I didn't dare look up. It'll sell your stomach, he said, cheerily, before heading to the front to speak to the guard who was chaperoning me. They spoke in hushed murmurs, but I heard them loud and clear. If there's any trouble of any kind, I want you to call me straight away, James said, his tone like splintering ice, though the guard just scoffed, leaning out of the window. With Robin, 
he laughed. She doesn't know what planet she's on, Marley. The girl's a blank slate. James didn't laugh. Just get her back to her room. When we got back to the hotel, the guard took a firm grip of my arm, dragging me into the reception area. After making a show of patting down his pockets, he announced he'd lost the key card for my room. He greeted the clerk, who sent me a wary look before his gaze snapped to the guard. Key cards are kept downstairs in the office, the clerk said in a bored-sounding tone. He gestured to an ancient-looking elevator. Room 305. We took the elevator which led us to the basement, a narrow hallway with bleach white walls. The guard stopped outside room 305. Wait here, he grunted. I nodded, suddenly conscious that I was being left alone, which gave me the perfect opportunity to explore. Who am I kidding? Waving a hand in front of my face, the guard chortled. Of course you'll stay here. Early, if I asked you to pitch yourself off a bridge, you'd do it without even hesitating. He shook his head. Marley's one fucked up son of a bitch. Still chuckling to himself, the guard slid into 305, his grip slipping from my arm. Stay right there, little bird. The door slammed shut behind him, and I forced my shaking legs forward. The hallway looked like it went on forever, doors lined parallel to each other. Lunging into a power walk, I peeked inside each room, pressing my face against the glass but I was just looking at what looked like storage spaces in abandoned rooms. I was halfway down the corridor, conscious of the guard appearing at any moment, when something flashed in front of my eyes. It took me several disorienting seconds to realize it was coming from one of the doors, specifically 309. Getting closer, the light only got more erratic. When I reached the door, I pressed my face against the glass, peering inside. Room 309 was dark, except the light, which seemed to be emitting from a TV screen. Unable to stop myself, I tried the handle and pushed it down. It was unlocked. There was no sign of the guard, so I let myself inside. Automatically, I found the light switch and clicked it on, but nothing happened. The room stayed dark. 309 was different to the other rooms. The others had been storage spaces illuminated by sickly yellow light, or pitch black. But 309 was only lit up with buzzing static from a TV screen. It reminded me of a doctor's surgery which had been abandoned years ago, everything left to rot away. It was the TV that I couldn't stop staring at. It looked old, ancient even, the type my grandparents had when they were kids. Though looking closer at the screen, it wasn't static I was looking at. There was a kid's cartoon playing. Looney Tunes. I recognised the images. I'd grown up with Cartoon Network's bright colours and high-pitched cartoons screaming from the characters, but, well, this was different. In fact, I'm not even sure it was an episode I was watching. It was black and white, and like the TV, the clip looked like it was at least the late 40s. The characters looked a lot uglier, bulbous and wrong. Compared to what I'd seen when I was a kid, this prehistoric film gave me the shivers. It was the same sequence playing repeatedly, bleeding through struggling static. Bugs Bunny was on screen eating a carrot, while Daffy Duck hit him over the head with a plank of wood. Bugs didn't seem too phased and continued eating the carrot, while Daffy got progressively more frustrated, slamming it down harder each time. The footage skipped and started again. Bugs eating the carrot... And Daffy sneaking up on him, sporting a devilish grin. I was so captivated by the images flickering on the TV screen, I didn't notice movement at the corner of my eye. At first, I thought it was a trick of the light, but then it happened again, this time accompanied by a scratching noise. Turning away from the TV, I realised I wasn't alone. The tripping static from the television screen illuminated the room fully, and I found myself staring at a shadow. Then a human figure sitting in what looked like a dentist's chair. Around them was a room full of gurneys and medical equipment. I started towards them, and the closer I got, the light revealed more. Noah! My castmate was sitting stiff, his wrists strapped to leather armrests. 
Noah's gaze was glued to the TV screen, his eyes wide and unseeing. With the gutter of my throat, I whispered his name. My castmate didn't respond, and my gaze travelled back to the screen where the sequence was still repeating over and over again, between tripping static. Whatever Noah was being forced to watch, it was doing something to him. I'm, I'm going to get you out of here, I managed to choke out. I grabbed his restraints in an attempt to free his wrists, but they were too tight. What do I do? I whispered. I'm here, Noah. What do I do? My attention turned back to the TV, back to Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck. Before I could stop myself, I was stumbling over to the screen and fumbling for an off switch. But even when I pushed buttons and flicked switches with shaking hands, nothing happened. And then, I heard tapping. It was barely audible, but in the silence of the room, I heard it. Making my way back to Noah, I noticed his eyes were still stuck to the cartoon. But there was the slightest bit of movement, his fingers under the restraints hitting the armrest. At first, I thought it was nothing, but there was a rhythm to the taps. He was sending me a message by stabbing his index into the plush leather of the armrest, and then swiping it across. Now, Noah had always talked about his love for all things puzzles and problem solving. Of course he'd know how to talk to me without the use of his mouth. I had to be quick. If the guard wasn't on my tail yet, he soon would be. There was no pen and paper available, so I grabbed a roll of tissue paper and a scalpel, inputting each tap and swipe. I used a circle for a tap and a horizontal line for a swipe. When I was done, Noah jolted in the chair, his eyes flickering, mouth opening like he was trying to speak. The TV, which until then had been on mute, started screeching with static, despite the cartoon staying mute. Oh, it seems crazy, but it was like he was reacting to the static, his body tremoring under the restraints. I watched in horror as my castmate's head fell forwards and Noah went limp, like his puppet strings had been severed. When I lifted his head... I caught something drip onto his shirt, a stream of startling crimson dribbling down his chin. I opened my mouth to call for help, but doing that would get me caught. I had no choice. Stuffing the toilet paper with Noah's message into my jeans, I left him, stumbling back out onto the corridor, bile burning in my throat. The guard was waiting for me, a smirk curved on his lips. In his hand was the keycard. Where'd you fly off to, little bird? I didn't reply. Couldn't reply. All I could think about was Noah. The guard didn't ask questions, which confused me. He took me to my room and locked the door. When I was sure I was alone, I studied Noah's message, trying to make sense of it, but I couldn't. And that's all I remember. I don't remember Rory coming back or James giving me a pill. After that, my memory is blank. Well, they know I saw something, and they tried to make me forget. But they failed. I don't know how they failed, but they failed. Luckily, I'd hidden Noah's message under my mattress, along with the phone. Well, I've tried Google, as well as pretty much every way to get help. But the internet doesn't work, so I can't even look up Noah's message. The App Store lets me download apps, but ones like Facebook and Twitter are blocked. All I have is this app. Even so, all I can do is post. If I want to try another subreddit, it won't let me. So, I need your help. Please tell me what Noah was trying to tell me. Oh. Look, I'm going to try and post this. Hopefully, if I'm clear-headed enough. I feel like I'm going crazy, like... What I saw was some kind of hallucination. Did I see right? I know I did. I'm going to try and update you as soon as I can. I can hear footsteps now, so I have to go. 
If they take me, I pray Rory finds this and continues to tell our story. Oh, small update. I've learned the date. God, I've lost so many days and every single one of them is blank. Anything could have happened to me, but I feel okay. That's good, right? I had scenes with Noah earlier. He seems normal, but I haven't spoke to him as Robin, only as my character. Oh, and Rory called me Katie this morning, and his English accent is gone. Is it crazy to think that, well, that he's becoming his character? Part 3. I'm running out of time. Now I'm terrified out of my mind, and I don't know what to do right now. The good news is I've managed to find an internet connection within the confines of this hotel. However, every way of getting help is still blocked. So once again, I'm coming to you. This time it's not just to give you an update, but also to ask you for help. I don't have to find a connection on set anymore, which is a relief. And hopefully I can post this today. Thankfully, I now have at least some kind of hold on the date. Once learning it last time, I made sure to input it into this phone, so I can make sure to anchor myself to some kind of normal. Since I last posted, I've managed to stay myself. Though at this point, I don't even know what that means. I'm clear-headed at least, and my thoughts are my own. Which right now is precious to me. I'm desperate to stay myself. To stay sane, because every minute that goes by, I'm struggling to hold on to reality. I'm struggling to accept this is my life right now. It's not a TV show or a movie, or some overpriced book you might get at Barnes & Noble. No, this is really happening to me, and if I'm honest, I'm freaking terrified. Sorry, once again, I can't stop shaking, so... The following account may contain typos and whatnot. I really don't care. I'm just going to write down everything I know. Oh, due to the virus, our filming schedule is all over the place right now, which means we film on weekends too, mostly reshoots. I know if my castmates and I weren't being drugged and turned into emotionless zombies, we definitely complain, but as you know, they're not themselves right now. And no matter how much I'm in denial, neither am I. Anyway, this morning we were due on set. Last night I couldn't sleep. After seeing Noah's message, my thoughts wouldn't shut up. I kept thinking about him trapped in that room, strapped down like an animal. The cartoon that he was being forced to watch and the scarlet rush of blood dribbling down his chin. Everything I saw felt like some kind of vivid hallucination, especially after seeing him every day since. Sure, Noah only spoke to me as Katie, and only on set, but he seemed like his usual self, even if he was acting. Noah plays Katie's love interest, Will, on the show, and the two of them are practically the same person, so apart from the all-too-familiar foggy eyes that look straight through me, like everyone else, Noah didn't seem like anything drastic had been done to him, which I was sure of when I'd seen him in room 309, staring blankly at some ancient Looney Tunes cartoon, where the static seemed to control him. No, I was not imagining it. I saw it with my own eyes. Noah, his body trembling, quivering under tough restraints. It looked like he was having a seizure. His wide eyes and parted lips still haunt my memory. He was silently screaming at me for help, and I couldn't do anything, only watching as a seemingly innocent cartoon caused him to writhe, blood spilling down his shirt. And that's what I can't understand. If I'd seen that, if I'd witnessed Noah go through that trauma, what had they done to him? Brainwashing seemed like the best guess, but it seemed like more than that. James had spoken of a first stage of treatment, which was the pill. Whatever had happened to Noah, that must have been the second. Is there a third? How many stages are there, and where does it end? What the hell is James planning? However, even if Noah was more or less acting like himself, his message to me was haunting my thoughts. Find Derek. What could that mean? Well, Derek was one of our producers and writers, as well as James's brother. Now, according to James, he'd left the show due to creative differences. 
After everything that's happened over the last few weeks, I know that's a lie. But why would Noah tell me to find Derek? As far as I knew, the two of them were only close as colleagues. Derek seems like the last person Noah will go to for help, so why did he seem desperate for me to find him? My character Katie was obsessed with mysteries and let them rule her life. And I started to wonder if she really was starting to take over me. Because part of me, splintered pieces of me deep, deep down, couldn't stop thinking about the bobby pin on my bedside cupboard, and if sticking it in the lock and jimming it a little would unlock the damn thing. But then I came back to reality, and quickly realised that the door to my room was locked by a keycard, not a key, but Katie, a ghostly presence skating the back of my thoughts, still wouldn't shut up. She was thinking of every escape attempt possible, and it was hard to block her out. After playing her non-stop, it felt like the character was slowly bleeding into me, every part of her spider webbing into my brain, leeching on. So, why Derek? I wondered, pushing Katie out. Why did Noah want me to find James's brother, and where was he anyway? It didn't make any sense, and overthinking it just hurt my head. I was lying on my back, staring at the ceiling, trying to force overpowering thoughts to the back of my head, when I heard it. Buzzing. Well, at first I thought an insect had flown in. I sat up in bed, blinking in the darkness. Leaning over to switch the table lamp on, the room flooded with light. But after several disorienting seconds of searching for a fly, well, there was nothing there. Except I now heard it. Burrowing under the thin blankets provided, I tried to sleep. But it was still there, a buzzing noise that was getting progressively more erratic. I checked the lamp to see if it was the bulb, but the buzzing noise wasn't coming from anywhere near me. Again I tried to force my brain to sleep, but the noise progressed from buzzing to a seemingly relentless swarm burying its way into my brain. I couldn't take it. Slipping out of bed and on shaky legs, I scanned the room. It was definitely an insect, I thought. Maybe it was trapped. The clock on the bedside read 1am, glaring red numbers burning into my eyes. After stumbling around, looking for an invisible insect, I gave up on my side and fell to my knees beside Rory's bed, ducking underneath to check. Rory had been worrying me the most. After completely losing his English accent in favour of the more broad American twang, just like the one he fakes to play Mac. I used to see him slipping in and out of English and American when we were shooting before all of this, where he would usually break into his English twang when he broke out into laughter or misread his lines. But now he spoke purely in an American accent. It shouldn't have, but it chilled me to the bone, like I was losing him to Mac. I knew James planned to silence us and turn us into zombies, but this was something else. As usual, Rory was fast asleep, curled into himself. I made sure not to wake him up, staying as quiet as possible. But the closer I got to my castmate, the more the buzzing rattling in my ears grew louder, and my heart dropped into my stomach. Slowly getting up, I leaned close to Rory. His eyes were shut, lips parted peacefully. I had to know. Getting as close as I could, his warm breath grazed my cheeks as I pressed my ear to the side of his head. The buzzing noise collapsed into a low humming. Sounds crazy, but it sounded like there was something there, inside his head, like a swarm of bees had nested in his skull. I jumped back, swallowing a shriek, and slipped back into bed, struggling to hold down a panic attack. I spent hours trying to find a logical explanation to what I'd heard, but I couldn't. The noise stopped eventually, leaving me to bask in the silence. But silence was worse. I wanted it back, so I could understand it so I could make sure I wasn't losing my freaking mind. Before I knew it, early morning sunlight was streaming through the blinds and I'd had next to no sleep. When I was teetering on the edge of slumber, my brain would remind me of Noah convulsing under restraints, blood spattered down his shirt, Izzy and her vacant eyes burning right through me, and the angry buzzing sound emitting directly from Rory's head. I cried myself to sleep, managing a mediocre one and a half hours. I dreamed of clusters of bees feasting on my fleshy brain tissue, burrowing directly into my skull, 
the buzzing noise becoming screeching static, streaming its way inside of me. Rory's voice pulled me back to reality, and I opened my eyes to find him standing over me. Rory's smile is something that keeps me sane. Before falling under the spell of the pill, there were rare moments when he would flash me a reassuring grin, even when I knew he was breaking apart inside. His larger-than-life personality was something I treasured, and when I blinked up at him, struggling to keep my eyes open, all I could see was Mac. All I could see was his character. His expression was blank, brown eyes glued to me, except I wasn't seeing the lovable idiot I normally saw in both fictional Mac and real Rory. Instead, I was seeing an emotionless shell with my friend's face. The buzzing noise was gone, and once again I had to remind myself it was real. It had been real. I had heard it, and everything I was seeing and hearing wasn't a figment of my imagination. Even if my mind was struggling, stretching to find logical answers. Get up! Rory's voice sent shivers slipping down my spine, Max American accent dominating his tone. He didn't smile, only inclining his head to the side, like he was looking at a stranger. His arms were folded across a thin, short sleeved shirt he was using for pajamas. My castmate jutted his chin. We have school. For a second, my guard was down, the facade I'd managed to keep crumbling. School? I questioned him, choking back the fear in my tone. Of course, Robin. James's voice trilled, filling my blood with ice. It was like an electric shock. I twisted around to face him, fashioning my expression back to vacant. Luckily, the writer didn't seem to notice. He was standing on the threshold with the usual, two white plastic cups of water and a paper brown bag of McDonald's breakfast. After weeks of being mindless and having the same routine, it was starting to take its toll on me. It was monotonous, and I was sick of the same bacon sandwich which tasted like cardboard, the same lukewarm fizz of coke slithering down my sandpaper throat. The thought of popping the pill into my mouth made me feel physically sick, but I kept a nonchalant face as James took a step towards us. Rory, as usual, stood still, his arms by his sides, staring forwards like a soldier awaiting orders. I copied him, mentally begging the boy not to speak. I wanted my castmate that morning. I wanted Rory's familiar accent and venomous mouth, like that first morning. I wanted him to rebel in some way, spitting swears at James like he was still holding on, like he was still with me, and I wasn't alone. Except... The Rory I knew was gone, and I had to come to terms with that behind my facade. James cleared his throat. Good morning to the two of you. Rory nodded, and I did too, making sure to pinpoint my glassy eyes directly at the writer. We did the usual, handing us the capsules, watching us take them, and checking if we'd actually swallowed. I lodged my pill between my teeth and waited in tense silence while James started going through our schedules for the day. Okay, we have a script reading for this morning, for episode six, which is of course the episode when... The writer's voice faded out in my ears, reduced to a low mumbling barely scathing the back of my consciousness. I only heard script meeting and something inside me ignited an idea slowly piecing itself together in my mind. It's now rare when we go to the riding offices. We haven't been since the start of the season, when everything went to shit. All I could think about was Noah's message. Derek left the show, but his office was in the building. Oh, if I managed to get in, there would no doubt be answers in there. Robin, does that sound okay? Snapping out of my thoughts quickly, I gave James a curt nod, despite having no idea what I was saying yes to. His gaze lingered on me for a moment, before he broke out into a grin. Wonderful. Now, open, sweetie. I want to make sure you're being a good girl. His words made my skin crawl. All I wanted to do was wipe that triumphant grin off his face, but, well, doing so would expose me. So I stepped forward obediently, hating how familiar my body was with his voice, eager to submit to him. Opening my mouth, I stayed still, maintaining my blank expression. 
Oh, James, only check quickly before pulling away. Confident, I'd swallowed. All right. He clapped his hands together and gestured to the food. A car will be waiting for you in fifteen minutes. Eat and get ready, and then we'll head to the writing offices. We've got a lot to do today, so hurry up. With a cheerful, almost dance to the door, James disappeared quickly, whistling to himself. When he was gone, I spat out the pill as usual, dumping it in the coke. After forcing myself to eat the sandwich, I showered and dressed, formulating a plan in my mind. Before the script meeting, I was going to break into Derek's office. Thankfully, it spaced out from the other writing rooms on the top floor, while the others are below. I knew that faking sickness wasn't going to cut it after the last time. As far as I knew, James did expect at least a flicker of humanity inside of us. A few days ago, Lana had asked to go to the bathroom. I knew she was completely under the pill's control, but still asked. James nodded, seemingly unfazed by my castmate speaking out of turn. And so that's what I was going to try. Dressing in a sweater and jeans, I grabbed a leather jacket that had been left out for me. Rory was still on my mind, as well as Noah's message. James expected us both to be waiting side by side when he came to collect us, and when I stationed myself next to my castmate, I leaned into him, listening out for the buzzing. But it was gone. Part of me wanted to grab Rory and shake him, attempt to snap him out of it. Before I could, James arrived, this time with the others in tow. We followed him like the obedient drones he'd turned us into. Noah and Izzy were shoulder to shoulder, Rory and I and Lana bringing up the rear. Something burned inside of me, an overwhelming urge to talk to them. Try and knock some sense into them. I wanted to drag Noah to the side and question him about Derek. I knew that was fruitless, though. I was the only one awake, like always. The others were trapped in some impenetrable trance while my mind was full of clarity. The car ride to the writing offices was the same as always. I sat in the same seat, I listened to the same radio station crackling through James's expensive speakers, pretending to listen when he went through our schedule for the fourth time. It always struck me how trapped I truly was when I turned my head and stared out of the window. Life seemed to go on as normal outside, while mine crumpled in front of my very eyes. We drove past ordinary people, some of whom probably knew our characters and had no idea about the truth behind us, that I was a prisoner of the show. Refusing to let myself slip into bitter melancholy, I fought to stay awake. My mind was working at a hundred miles an hour, and a clash of aromas and overwhelming whiff of perfume and cologne from my castmates turned my stomach. We arrived at the writing offices and were escorted inside by James and two guards, the whole way there, I was struggling to think of the perfect excuse to break away from the group. I stuck to Noah's side, finding comfort in his company, even if he wasn't all there. He stared forwards, unblinking, an unsettling smile on his lips. The crew were buzzing around, talking animatedly, and I caught looks thrown our way. Pursed lips and slitted eyes. I stayed stock still, watching James swipe his keycard in the door and push it open. But my mind was whirring, my stomach collapsing on itself. My castmates stood together, blank eyes and unsmiling lips, bar Noah. And I quickly came to the realisation that the looks from the crew, they looked, well, unnerved. The five of us were freaking them out. There, James, with his usual smile, widened the door and ushered us in. When the others took their seats silently, I hesitated in the doorway. The room was far too warm and my skin prickled with heat. The table was already set up with multicoloured scripts and glasses of water. Glimpsing a slip of paper with my name designating my seat, I got a crippling wave of deja vu from our last meeting. Before James had entered, Noah had put Rory into a teasing chokehold, Izzy slapping at him to let the boy go, Lana rolling her eyes and smirking at her phone. Looking at them now, though, they were strangers. And it hurt. It fucking hurt that I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move. My feet felt like they were glued to the floor. Waves of emotion hitting me like waves of ice water. Robin. James's voice sounded like it was underwater. Instead, I was seeing myself handing my phone over to James. My phone. My chest clenched. Bile burning. The 
back of my throat. I'd become so used to living like a prisoner, like a submissive doll, I'd almost forgotten what it was like to live normally. And I had. In this room, just weeks ago, I'd had the luxury of staring down at my phone when James was interrogating me, clutching it to my chest and making a note to myself that I had to call Mum at some point. I never had. There was probably someone texting her for me to avoid her getting suspicious. Robin! James's hiss of my name made me inwardly jump, my stomach slithering into my toes. My eyes were burning with tears. I felt like I was drowning. Nodding my head in acknowledgement, I blinked at James blankly, hoping to God I wasn't showing any emotion. Is something wrong? James's eyes were sharp. My throat was dry. Yes, I responded, copying the other's almost robotic tone. Can I use the bathroom? The writer's eyes narrowed, but he nodded. Of course. Should we start without you? I didn't move, even when my legs urged me to get the hell out of there. James's gaze didn't leave me. His lips curved into a smirk. He was testing to see if I was going to answer. On the pill, we're supposed to be silent unless we have a command or are spoken to. So, I didn't answer, making sure to hold eye contact despite my pounding heart. After an uncomfortable moment, James shook his head. Go, oh, he muttered, gesturing to the doorway. You look a little peaky, so take as long as you like. His smile only broadened, and without missing a beat, I hurried out of the door, only for him to slam it behind me. Right, he said from inside. His voice had the tone of a schoolteacher. Let's begin with Mac and Stella, shall we? To my surprise, there were no guards on the hallway, and I found myself staring at the exit doors. Escape. I could run and not stop running until I'd found someone who could help me. When I weaved the scenario in my head, however, I knew I'd only get blank looks and rolled eyes from strangers. They'll think I've lost my mind, I thought, backing away and heading towards the stairs, which meant the only way I was going to help myself and the others was delving into Derek's office. Taking three steps at a time, I headed to the top floor. Still no guards, which was weird. When I wrapped my hand around the bronze handle to Derek's office, it clicked and slid open. After twisting around and searching for pursuers, I stepped inside, shutting and locking the door behind me. The second I strode into the writer's office, I knew there'd been some kind of struggle. Derek Marley was a neat person compared to his brother, and every time I'd visited before, everything would be in perfect order on his desk, scripts and filming schedules in color-coded piles. Instead, what I was faced with was chaos. Derek's desk was upturned, an explosion of paper piled on the floor. His MacBook was on its side in a pool of what looked like old invoices. I froze in the doorway before picking through the pile of Derek's belongings. There was definitely a struggle. My character seemed to come to life inside my mind, pointing out the obvious. A mug of coffee on the carpet, its contents spilled and long since dried into it. A black pair of glasses were under the desk, the lenses smashed. Someone had stamped on them. The laptop looked like it had survived the attack, so I grabbed it, setting the MacBook on the floor. The screen lit up when I pressed the power button, and I let out a sharp breath of relief. When I was kneeling down, inspecting the laptop screen, something caught my eye, a glimmer of silver underneath Derek's plush leather chair. I reached for it, my fingers curling under something cylindrical and narrow. A syringe. Not just that. Something was wrapped around the plastic. With shaking hands, I unraveled a handwritten letter. The syringe was labelled Severodol, 100 milligrams. But right then, I was captivated by the letter. The handwriting was unmistakably Derek's shorthand. It shouldn't have surprised me, considering Noah's message, but seeing my castmate's name heading the letter sent me into a cold sweat. Noah, I'm sorry I can't help you. I know how much you want out, but I'm telling you, releasing this to the public will be your downfall, especially through my Instagram account. I spoke to my brother, and after many disagreements, I've come to the decision that he is not well. He's not thinking straight. 
Uh, this year has been cruel to us, as you know. Due to the pandemic and holding production back in March, I'm afraid James has become driven to, well, keep the show on air and will do anything to make sure it does. Why, well, uh, have a confession to make. I've written this letter multiple times, unsure of how I'm going to tell you this, because I've made many mistakes. Those of which you will never forgive me for. I can't pin all of this on my brother. This project is ours, and, and I'm not going to deny being involved. Now, if you're reading this, and I've not managed to tell you in person, it means something's happened to me. But don't worry about me. I'll be fine. What I need you to do, boy, is focus on what I'm going to tell you. On my laptop are details of the horrific plans my brother and the network combined have for you, Isabel, Rory, Lana, and Robin. He's convinced that you're sick for wanting to leave, and he's willing to do anything in his power to keep the five of you on the show. Though I have my suspicions, he's been wanting to do this for a while. I couldn't participate in it fully. Admittedly, I did agree to the beginning stages. I wanted discipline and compliance with the five of you, since we're approaching a rough stretch of months, but well, the later stages are where I draw the line. My brother's trying to play God, and I want no part in his sick activities. The master password to my laptop is Delta 6785-1245. Click on the folder named Project Daffodil. You'll find all details there. I just hope you find this before my brother begins the later stages. Tonight he's planning to begin stage one. If he ever reaches the harrowing phases, use the shot and remember, time is your worst enemy. You cannot let my brother reach stage four. Be safe, all of you. Everyone here is against you. You were right, Noah. The show has lost its heart. James has turned it into a money-making machine. I'm deeply sorry that what started as a passion project between us all has reached these lows. Oh, do not go to the police. There are people far higher up than my brother who want to see this project through to the end. My brother's treating it like an experiment, and right now, you are his guinea pigs. Make no mistake. If you do get away from James, you will not be free. The show owns all of you. The police will send you back to my brother. You'll also find the contact details of a friend of mine you can trust. She can get you out of there into a safe location, but you need to be careful. Again, I'm so sorry. To all of you, my sins will haunt me for the rest of my life. Derek. Oh, I didn't have time to go over what I'd read but it was enough to send me into fight or flight. With trembling hands, I stabbed in Derek's password, and the galaxy background flashed up. The battery was almost dead, so I had to be quick. Following the instructions in the letter, I scanned the mass of folders scattered on the desktop, clicking into one named Project Daffodil, and was prompted with a password. I typed in the same one, and after staring at the rainbow wheel spin around, a box popped up with columns of folders. The top folder was the name of our show, followed by our names in alphabetical order. Lana Faraday, success. Rory Gallagher, success. Robin Harley, to be decided. Noah Keating, success. Isabel Wright, success. TBD. My mind was worrying, to be determined meaning whatever had been done to the others was yet to be done on me. While the other names were highlighted light green, my name was a much darker orange. I felt sick. I wanted to shut the laptop and run. I didn't know where I was going to go, but I had to get away. Sometimes being blissfully ignorant was a good thing, but I knew I had to see what Daffodil was. I had to know what they were doing to my castmates. I started with Noah, clicking onto his name. A list of .mov files appeared, and I clicked into the first one, bringing up QuickTime Player. It was a video clip lasting eight minutes, though I didn't have to press play to understand what I was watching. I found myself staring at the same room I'd seen Noah in, this time flooded with dizzying white light. This time he was in a reclined position, his eyes closed, a plastic mask pressed over his face. Noah's eyes were an angry red, and I glimpsed what looked like bandages wrapped around his ear. It was what was beside the chair that sent my heart into a frenzy. A silver contraption which looked straight out of Doctor Who. Unable to stop myself, 
I went back to a list of names, this time clicking on Rory's name, bringing up the same player. The same background, clinical white light bathing his face. Like Noah, Rory's eyes were shut, a mask pressed over his nose and mouth. His wrists were strapped to leather armrests, and seatbelt-like restraints were pinning him to the chair. Rory's right eye looked swollen, just like Noah's. Clicking play, I dragged the video forward. When it started playing again, Rory's eyes were blinking open, staring dazedly at the camera. A voice played through the speakers, and I jumped. James's voice. Insertion successful. Give me a moment to talk to the young man. Rory's eyes widened, his gaze flicking around the room. He gave a half-hearted tug on the restraints. His pupils looked dilated and foggy, but he looked alert, awake. The mask had been removed, and for a moment he looked like he was struggling to speak. What? Rory slurred, his English accent coming out full pelt. What's going on? James chuckled, his laugh sputtering into static through the speaker. The date is the 1st of October, 2020, and the time is eight minutes past ten, he said, before clearing his throat. How are you feeling? Rory grunted, like I've been hit over the head. What? He licked his lips, shaking his head. What did you do to me? Your sickness, young man. We're simply treating your sickness. Now, state your name. Rory tugged at the restraints, pinning his wrists to the armrests. I'm not sick, arsehole. I'm not going to repeat myself. James's tone hardened. State your name. I can't move. Rory struggled in the restraints, hissing in pain when he twisted his head to yank at them. Why can't I move? Your full name, please, James said breezily, for documentation purposes. Rory Gallagher, Rory snapped, lips curling into a snarl. What the fuck is this? Your age and occupation too, please. What? Glaring at the camera now, Rory blinked rapidly. I'm 19, no, I'm 20, I'm an actor. Very good. James's voice was grating, patronizing. Once again for me, there's a good boy. You son of a bitch, Rory gritted out. What the fuck did you do to me? Where are the others? I caught a stray tear dribble down his cheek. Rory's voice was shaking, even if he was putting on a front. I want to go home. I want out. Do you hear me? The others aren't important, James hummed. Once again, please. Rory's jaw clenched and he looked like he might start yelling, squirming in the restraint. But an ear-piercing screech sounded out, and I recognised it automatically. The static from the cartoon. I expected Rory to start convulsing like Noah, but the boy just flopped down, his expression going slack, his arms slamming down on the armrests. Your name, James said, a hint of delight in his tone. Nice and clear for me. My castmate's eyes were open, but there was nothing there. It was exactly what I'd been seeing for weeks now. The same glassy eyes, a void of nothing through warm browns. Mac. The American accent came out natural and fluent, bleeding into the name. Mac Pry. Age. James prompted. Rory didn't blink. Sixteen. Hmm. The writer was practically laughing with glee. <laughs> Occupation. High school student. Rory droned. Wonderful. James trilled. Simply wonderful. He was talking to somebody else. Give him a few weeks to settle in and then we can move on to the final stage. Complete removal of lingering consciousness. Of course, we can replicate the young man's personality easily for press days and, of course, the fans. That'll be easy. Once the chip is stable, there'll be no need for the boy. He cleared his throat. He'll be disposed of. 
Do you understand me? Another voice, one I didn't recognize, though my ears were roaring. Yes, sir, the voice murmured. Oh, I'll need to keep an eye on him for a few hours. Make sure the device is connected to the iris. We don't want a repeat of what happened with Mr. Keaton. He's stabilized. Miss Harley's been taken care of. Mm, it's hidden in plain sight, Marley. For that, I must applaud you. James chuckled. <laughs> that was all my brother, Dr. Jason. He's the smart one, after all. Something turned in my gut, and I lurched back, choking up the sandwich I'd eaten earlier. But I didn't have the luxury of barfing my insides out. I had to get the information I needed, and get out of there. I didn't need to watch anymore. Shutting down the clips and then the following windows, I searched for Derek's emergency contact. Scanning through the files in the Project Daffodil folder was fruitless, but a blank folder caught my eye. Clinking into it, there was a name, address, and number. Looking around, my gaze lingered on a scalpel sticking from the pile of papers. I had to get it out. That's all I could think of. Whatever the hell was inside their eye, I had to get it out. I grabbed the scalpel, slipping it into my right boot. I shoved the syringe and Derek's letter into my jeans, grabbed a pen, scribbling down the details, and got out of there, fast, wiping bile off my chin with the cuff of my sweater. I could barely breathe, and my fingers kept grazing my right eye. James's words wouldn't leave my head as I stumbled down each step. It felt like I was floating on air. James was turning us into our characters and it succeeded with everyone but me. Not just that, he was planning on eradicating lingering consciousness. That meant fully removing them, right? In favor of whatever he's replaced them with. When I got back to the script read-through, James took one look at my ashen cheeks and the bile staining my sweater and nodded, gesturing for me to sit down without questioning me. The meeting didn't feel real. Nothing felt real. My mouth worked, but they were words James wanted me to say. I ran through my script as Katie, making sure to come to life as her, when allocated, and when the read-through was over, I let the writer pull me back to the car, shoving me inside. I felt paralyzed. Knowing what was going on and what his plans were for us, I couldn't move, couldn't breathe. We drove back to the hotel in silence and Rory and I were taken back to our room as usual. But this time, a television screen was rolled in, the same type I'd seen in 309. Sit down, both of you, James commanded, and Rory did so. After a beat, I did too. A man came in and set up the TV, inserting what looked like a VCR into an ancient player. The same black and white cartoon popped up onto the screen, flicking through static. Rory's gaze went directly to the screen, and the writer nodded with a smile. That's right, Mr. Gallagher. I did the usual, copying Rory, but James came to kneel in front of me. He grabbed my chin and jerked my head forwards. His eyes were hard and merciless. Inclining his head, he hummed. You're not quite ready yet, Robin, he hummed. Your mind is far too sensitive, young lady. Part of me wanted to question him, choking out tangled cries in the back of my throat. Instead, I stayed still. I held my breath, swallowing a screech. James's grip hardened. In my peripheral, Bugs Bunny was chewing the same carrot, and Daffy Duck advancing towards him. You're a stubborn little bitch, aren't you, eh? The rider stood up, seemingly composing himself. Anyway, here's some late-night entertainment for you both. His eyes flickered to me. Hopefully this will stabilize you, sweetie. He pouted. I don't want to risk losing my best star, after all. With a cheery wave, James left. But the door didn't shut. It bounced before hitting the frame. Retreating footsteps told me the writer hadn't noticed. Jumping up, I grabbed one of the paperbacks James had provided for me for entertainment, and I wedged it under the door. Failing to switch the TV off, I grabbed the table it was on and turned it around, and Rory blinked, his gaze wandering, like he was searching for it. 
Rory! Kneeling in front of the boy, I grabbed his shoulders and shook him, but he was limp like a doll. His eyes were glassy and vacant, staring at the TV screen. Hey! My voice was teetering on the edge of hysterics, and I slapped him hard. Rory, look at me! My voice wobbled. Hey, look at me! But he wasn't looking at me. He wasn't fucking looking at me, and I wondered if he was already Mac, if Rory was gone. I couldn't stop myself. Grabbing the lamp from the bedside table, I slammed it into the back of his head. I only realized my mistake when my castmate fell back onto the bed, his eyes rolling into the back of his skull. He's still breathing, but, well, I'm terrified for him. What do I do? I need to get this thing out of him, but I don't want to blind him. I have a scalpel, but I don't know anything about eye anatomy. You saw what James said. If I don't get this thing out of him, out of all of them, then I'm going to lose them. Please. Help me, please. Tell me what to do. I don't know what to do, and Rory isn't waking up. I still have the shot that Derek left, but I don't know what it is. I can't search anything. I can't look for medical help. I can't do anything, and James could be back at any moment. Is there a way to get this thing out of Rory's eye without blinding him? Is there a way to check for concussion? Please, help me. Part 4. I think I've killed my castmates. I think I've killed them. That's all that's running through my head right now. I've killed them. I have killed them. I've freaking killed them. No. No, I can't think like that. I have to stay positive. Well, it's so freaking hard to stay positive right now. As much as I want to tell you what's going on right at this moment, I have to go back days from now before everything exploded. Before I lost both myself and my friends. I have to write all of this down so I can register it fully and accept it. I have to accept it. Because right now, I can't. I've tried writing this so many times, but my head is so foggy and my thoughts feel like candy floss. The phone screen is so bright it hurts my eyes. I have to concentrate. That's what I keep telling myself. I have to breathe. Just keep breathing. It's not like I'm hiding anything anymore. They know I'm sober. They know I'm awake and it's only a matter of time before they come for me too. To do the same thing to me. Oh God, they're going to kill me. I'm going to die. Maybe I deserve it, though. After all, I think I've killed their biggest stars. Right, I'm going to start from when I last updated you. Once again, I have no recollection of how many days I've lost. James took them from me. I want to check it myself, but part of me would rather stay ignorant. All I know is that it's sunny outside. The sky is blue and the trees are golden brown. Fall, my favourite season. Feels weird to remember that. And I have a favourite season. Katie's favourite is summer. She likes to go to the lake with her friends and swim in the river. I know more about my character than I know myself, and every second that goes by I feel like I've been tipped upside down and emptied of everything I am. So I'm going to remind myself before it's too late. My name is Robin Harley. At least, that's how you know me. I wrote my real name before this one because it feels like it's fading along with everything I am. But I know who I am. My favourite book is Kafka on the Shore. My favourite food is Chicken Alfredo. I have a dog called Julia, and I'm terrified of the dark. Such small things, like a kid making a list. This is easier for me, though. I must remember who I am before it's taken away. For James, I must be Katie. And for you, I'm Robin. I miss being called by my real name. My mother named me after her favourite flower. I grew up thinking it was a stupid name. I wanted to be called a pretty name like Holly or Charlotte. My friends often asked me why my name was spelled the way it was, and how to pronounce it. As a kid, I was mortified. But as I grew up, I began to love my name, treasure what it meant to my mum to call me it. Well, I didn't think something as simple as a name and identity could be snatched so cruelly, but it has. I almost feel like I'm writing a story, like we're just characters in someone else's coerced reality. 
That's ironic, considering the plan our network has for us. I'm nothing but a puppet in James's sick game. I am a shell for Katie Parker, and everything that is me that is... Well, he plans to eradicate. Like it's that easy. Like talking away who I am, my consciousness is like child's play. It's the bloodstains that I can't stop thinking about. So much blood, so much life draining away like it was nothing. Like they were nothing. Like they were nothing. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm not making any sense. I can't make sense right now, even as I read while I type, I might as well be reading hieroglyphics. The floor underneath my feet feels like liquid when I stand on it. There's blood on Rory's bed. It's only a little bit, a smear of crimson staining light pink pillowcases but it's twisting my stomach. My chest is aching. Every time I look at his bed, I want to scream. I want to scream until my throat is fucking raw, until my lungs have collapsed. It's Noah all over again. But at that point, Noah survived. I didn't think he would after seeing his body convulsing in front of me, flickering eyes still glued to Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck bleeding through an ancient static. Well... I'll never forget the way his head had dropped limply, bouncing on his chest like a puppet severed from his strings. His fingers, which had been frantically tapping out Morse code, had gone still. Everything that was him, that was Noah, had gone. And for one heart-stopping moment, I thought I'd lost him. Well, I didn't lose him. You already know that. Thanks to Derek Marley's confession, I now know that they weren't trying to kill Noah. Instead, they were using his body like a host, as if his character was a parasite. I've gone through the stages in my head so many times I know them off by heart. James's voice still crackling through static on each video clip, haunting my thoughts, as if the man himself was burrowing his way into my mind, forcing himself inside every piece of me. Stage 1. MTM. Stage 2. Programming. Stage 3. Insertion. Stage 4. Stage 4. Stage 4. Stage 4. I thought I could still save Noah. I could save Rory and Izzy and Lana. I thought I could save them. I thought I could save them. The blood on Rory's sheets makes me sick. I can't stop thinking about them. I just can't stop thinking about... Well, I'll get to that. Because I'm here to tell our story. In what I hope is some kind of cohesive, even if it's a seemingly never-ending stream of consciousness, which doesn't make any sense. Sorry about that. I don't cut out what I write. I want to reread everything that took place, every thought I had, even if it makes the least lick of sense. Every emotion I felt, I want to feel it again. I want to torture myself again, but I know I'll never feel the way I'm feeling right now. No. Nothing. I feel nothing. Maybe I am Katie. Maybe James forced her into me during my days, when the days were bleeding together, the pitch dark and sunlight colliding. But my thoughts weren't mine, and when they were, when clarity took over, I struggled to understand why I was so freaking numb, why I couldn't cry. Why I'd stripped Rory's bed of his covers and thrown them in the wardrobe. Why I sat against it for what felt like oblivion, with my back against cool, hard wood, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't open it again. Why I couldn't look inside, because I'd break apart all over again. Now, my head's clear. I know why. The sun is less of a confusing haze, and I can think a little clearer. So I'm going to do what I always do since I found you. Now that my mind is clear, I'm going to stop thinking about the wardrobe and instead lose myself in you. Inside this stupid phone, which isn't even mine. It hasn't got my pastel blue phone case and the lock screen of me and my mother standing under a maple tree in Japan. No, it has none of that. Not my Apple playlist or my Instagram page. My endless collection of notes, which is just shopping lists casting calls or snippets of poems that come to me, and my mum just a text or phone call away. My phone is gone. Except 
this phone feels like mine, even if there's none of my personality, a total blank. I've kept it hidden for so long, a secret under my mattress, the one thing stopping me from losing my mind. I'm going to write to you and leave nothing out. I'm going to tell you everything in as much detail as possible, despite my shaking hands and concaving stomach. Writing to you is my outlet. I know not many are reading and that most of you are skeptical, but I'm truly grateful for each and every comment you leave. Thank you for translating Noah's message. Thank you for telling me what was in the shot in Derek's office. Without you, I would have crumbled by now. So if you're listening, I beg of you, please keep going. If you have to tear apart everything I say, take notice of hints that I leave, like places that I have to blank out, because... You're my only hope right now. You're my only connection to the real world, to a reality I've been taken away from. So please, don't give up on me. Tell me you understand. Tell me you want some kind of update. Because you are all I have. I say this because, once again, I need your help. And hopefully for the last time. The last time I updated you, I'd made what I thought was the biggest mistake of my life. Slamming Rory over the head with a table lamp. He'd gone limp, falling back, his eyes rolling to the back of his head. Well, I took your advice and didn't use the shot. I didn't know what it would do to him, especially if he had some kind of brain or head injury. Instead of doing what my heart was screaming at me to do, I slammed the door shut and removed the book. Guards, I thought, hysterically. There were too many guards and I would never leave the others. I felt selfish. Wrong, like my heart had been ripped out of my chest. But I held myself, and I stayed with Rory all night, waiting for him to wake up. Except, he didn't. And the more time progressed, the more the glaring red letters on my bedside clock showed later and later, the more the sick feeling in my gut worsened. Rory! I felt like I was on fire, climbing onto his bed and lifting his head onto my lap. I felt for bumps and bruises, but mostly blood. I checked the pillow and sheets, but they were clean. He was breathing. I kept telling myself that, pressing my hand against his chest. He didn't move. His body stayed flaccid, draped against me. He was freezing cold, so I bundled him under the blankets. Laying next to him, my mind screamed at me to do something. Tell James. I was at war with myself. If Rory really was hurt and needed medical attention, I was killing him to save myself, so I didn't get caught. Did I care more about my castmate or being sober? Especially if Rory was just knocked out. Well, that thought haunted me well into the midnight hours. I fell in and out of sleep, but I didn't dream. I was too panicked to relax and allow my mind some kind of peace. I couldn't. I was drifting off to sleep for what felt like the tenth time when... Something snapped. At least, that's what it sounded like. I shot up, disoriented, and quickly realized that the same buzzing, the same noise of a swarm of bees, was slicing into the silence I'd found myself wrapped in. My attention went straight to Rory, and sure enough, it was coming from him. But something was... different. The first time I'd heard it, the sound was like prickling electricity or the erratic wings of an insect. But this time it sounded like popping, like something was snapping, crackling inside my friend's head. Slowly I slipped off Rory's bed and checked him once more. Still no movement. His eyes were still shut. His breathing was still normal. Knowing what was inside Rory, I knew the sound must have been the chip, what James had inserted into his eye. It was his character, the parasitic Mac Price. Briefly, I thought about attempting to get it out with the scalpel I'd hidden under my bed. But oh, I could blind him. With one wrong move, I could easily blind him. So I crawled back into my own bed and buried my head in the pillows that smelled of lavender. Reminded me of home. I don't know how long I slept for. All I remember is being woken by a flock of birds screeching outside. As soon as I brushed off slumber, reality hit me hard. Rory. The room was quiet and my heart sank into my gut. I twisted around in bed, expecting to see my castmate still draped over sickly yellow covers, eyes shut. 
Well, the first thing I noticed was Rory's bed was empty. The covers and pillows were on the ground, and when I frantically searched for him, I found him. Rory was standing in the same stance, straight shoulders, arms by his side. He was staring forwards, that familiar vacant look splayed across his expression. He was already dressed in Mac attire, a short sleeve shirt and jeans. The early morning sun was streaming through the blinds, setting strands of his brown hair alight. His eyes were wide, earthy brown, a wrinkle between his brows. At that moment, I took a snapshot in my mind. If James was going to turn me into Katie, then I was going to remember him. I was going to remember myself. When I happened to look into the reflection of James's glasses when he was leaning close, I glimpsed a girl who was far too thin, malnutrition transforming once healthy cheeks to ashen white. I saw tired eyes staring back, vacant and foggy with the phantom drug I was swallowing every day. I saw mousy blonde hair which used to be plastered across magazine stands, beauty magazines and Teen Vogue. It seemed crazy that that girl was me, the girl who played Katie Parker. Because underneath the preppy blonde ponytail and face of makeup, there was me. It made me wonder, did people see it? Did the public know, or did they look past all of that to see their favourite character? Is that all I was to them? Katie. Fucking Katie Parker. I didn't know what to think, whether to be relieved that I hadn't seriously hurt Rory, or frustrated that he was still under James's control. I was speechless, my mouth opening and closing, words choking my throat. I wanted to say so much, but... All I really wanted to do was bury my head in his shoulders and sob until my chest was aching. Before I could open my mouth or move, there was a sound of familiar footsteps approaching our room, and I dived up, practically throwing myself beside Rory, slipping back into my facade. Standing shoulder to shoulder as usual, we waited for James. But when the door opened, and the writer walked in with his usual wide smile and twinkling eyes, I could have sworn Rory had flinched ever so slightly. It wasn't noticeable, at least not to James. But to me, well, I felt it. I felt the tremor that ran through him, his shoulder bouncing against mine. Something inside me ignited, and for the first time in what felt like forever, I had hope. Hope that braining Rory with that lamp had knocked out the chip connected to his iris. Except that, that moment I refused to get properly hopeful. No way, I had to keep my facade. Even if all I really wanted to do was turn to Rory and demand if he was himself. If he was like me, awake and aware, struggling to hide behind a character. Instead, I played along as usual. We were given the pill, which I had mastered the art of hiding behind my bottom teeth. I swallowed with emphasis and opened my mouth so James could lean in. He did, the glint in his eyes sending ice sliding down my spine. Kids, he addressed us, spreading his arms in a greeting. How did you like last night? Did you enjoy your late night entertainment? Something struck me, like a knife stabbing into my back. The TV, I thought, struggling to stay completely immobile. But at the corner of my eye, it was back to where James had originally placed it the ancient screen facing forwards, instead of towards the wall where I'd shoved it. James seemed none the wiser, and I allowed myself to let out a breath. As usual, Rory and I didn't reply. James carried the usual, a brown paper bag full of breakfast sandwiches and two plastic cups with water. Robin, James nodded at me. You look like you're making progress. He winked. Perhaps I should take you for a consultation after today's shoot. How's that sound? I didn't move, keeping my gaze glued to him, waiting for him to look away, mentally begging the bastard to be distracted. Derek's confession was still on my mind, and what the network and James had collectively done to my castmates, and that I was next. T. B. D. To be determined. I had to fight back a shiver. Struck with the sudden overwhelming urge to scratch at my right eye, 
Beads of sweat slipped down the back of my neck. James cocked his head and chuckled when I only stared back, just like he wanted. He was used to this, used to my body working the way he wanted, twisting and turning the way he wanted, my submissive eyes drinking him in, and nothing coming out of my mouth. I could practically see the glee lighting up his eyes every time I was forced to stand like a soldier, awaiting orders from his smug mouth. Hmm? The writer hummed, pinching my chin. Oh, I'll take that as a yes, sweetheart. Staying still, I forced myself not to breathe. James moved on to Rory and handed the pill to my castmates. Hmm, Mr. Gallagher, he beamed. I'm pleased to tell you that you'll be entering stage four today, along with Mr. Keaton, as well as Miss Faraday and Bright. Bile slithered up my throat, but I still didn't move, my gaze falling to the carpet, burning into each fiber. Oh, I wanted to scream, but the words wouldn't come out. James's words felt like lightning bolts. They were going ahead with stage four with Rory, Noah, Lana, and Izzy, and I couldn't stop it. The writer's words had not left my head, still alive in my skull, prodding and poking until I couldn't bear it. The complete removal of consciousness, James had said, which was them. Whatever was left of my friends, what hadn't already been purged from them, tearing them from themselves, those last, fl those last flickers of what I loved. He was going to take it away. James was going to take it away forever. And what would be left? Nothing. Just a shell, a pretty face for their character. I'd heard James loud and clear. Give him a few weeks to settle in, and then we can move on to the final stage. Complete removal of lingering consciousness. Of course, we can replicate the young man's personality easily for press days, and of course the fans. That'll be easy. There'll be no need for the boy. He'll be disposed of. Do you understand me? Disposed of? My ears were roaring. How was James planning on disposing with them? What did that even mean? His words were cutting deep. I felt sick. No, I was going to be sick. My cheeks felt like they were on fire. My legs were ready to give way. Why? Max, all too familiar American twang, sliced cleanly through my thoughts. My head snapped up. For a disorienting moment, I forgot I was supposed to be keeping behind a facade, and an hysterical bubble of laughter climbed its way up my throat. I hadn't laughed in so long, and it almost felt alien to me, but I managed to swallow it down. Rory's expression was still blank, still vacant, but the crease between his brows had grown. His lip was slightly curled into what might have been a frown. He looked confused, which at that point was better than nothing. James's expression had twisted in a flash, his eyes slitting, lips twisting into a scowl. He was still holding the pill out to the boy, who wasn't taking it, his arms staying by their sides. The writer cleared his throat, composing himself despite being rattled. I'm sorry. What was that, Mr. Gallagher? I rest, keeping my gaze on Rory, and everything inside me was begging, screaming at him to lash out, teeth gritted, eyes blazing. Rory didn't do that, however. He seemed to flinch again, but this time it was noticeable. His whole body shuddered, his eyes flickering, before his right arm jolted, and he reached out and took the pill. Well, maybe I was imagining it, but it was like Rory was glitching. Mr. Gallagher... Stepping forward, James watched Rory pop the pill into his mouth. My castmate's expression had gone blank once more, but his arm was still trembling, pressed against mine. Rory swallowed the pill and opened his mouth on order, before the writer pulled out a small, handheld torch. He clicked it on, motioning Rory towards him. Rory complied, and let James shine the light in his eyes. He didn't even wince. James checked both eyes, leaning in close. Hmm. James clucked his tongue. Perhaps you had some kind of momentary malfunction. He grabbed my castmate's bare arms and squeezed him, beaming. 
Don't you worry, young man. Once the final stage is complete, there will be nothing to interfere with the programming. The original consciousness will be completely removed, which will, of course, be a relief for the two of us. James's words didn't sink in. I didn't let them. If I did, I'd shatter there and then, and James would catch me out. So I didn't move. I didn't breathe, and blinked back the sting in my eyes. Understand? James motioned for Rory to nod, and my castmate did, his arms falling limply back to his sides. Wonderful. The writer started to go through the same old routine, briefing us on our schedules, as well as lecturing us on being on our best behaviour, despite knowing the two of us were under the influence of a mind-altering pill, as well as a microchip forcing our characters inside our heads. I mostly tuned out trying to think of a way to save the others from what I was sure was a fate worse than death. Derek Marley had said that participating in the project would haunt him forever. His last message to Noah was sincere, but he was right. Noah would never forgive him. None of us would. I had to get them out. James's voice faded into white noise, until he reached the door and turned to the two of us. Eat and get ready for the day, please. I want things to go smoothly, so make sure to be good kids. He chuckled and then winked. <laughs> Mr. Gallagher, I'll see you after the shoot. The writer gave me a dismissive wave. Miss Harley, a guard will pick you up as usual and take you home, since I'll be quite busy. Nodding as if he was reassuring himself everything was going to be just fine, James hurried out, whistling some old Disney song that I vaguely recognized. When the door slammed shut, I let my breath go, dropping to my knees. Spitting the pill out, I swallowed hot bile in my throat, willing myself not to hurl. Hot tears were spilling down my cheeks and I couldn't stop them, no matter what I did. The severity of the situation came over me like waves of ice-cold water, and I wanted to curl into a ball and disappear into the floor. I wanted to be anywhere else than that room with my brainwashed castmate who I knew I was about to lose in favour of a fictional character. Bunching my fists into my eyes, I struggled to my feet and forced myself to the wardrobe we share, where my Katie attire was packed inside. I felt disgusting, still wearing the sweats I'd slept in. When I twisted to Rory, I'd meant to ask him if his head was hurting or if he felt sick. Despite knowing my castmate was a submissive doll, I still wanted to know. But when I turned to him, Rory was still standing in the same spot. He was staring at something, and when I edged closer, holding my breath, I realised the pill was pinched between his thumb and index finger. The colour was darker, dyed to an almost purple shade with his saliva. Looking closer, his expression was no longer blank. Instead, there was the slightest glimmer of awareness in his eyes. I held on to that with everything I had. Rory! I choked on his name, and he flinched again, turning to face me. I knew then, when my castmate's gaze landed on me, that something was wrong. His eyes were twitching, which seemed to affect his whole face, his cheeks wet with tears. A million emotions flashed across his expression, and he pressed two fingers to his right eye. When I said his name again, with the gutter of my throat, his gaze found mine, but Rory didn't look at me, well, not really. His lip curled and his eyes slit with pain and frustration, but there was no glint of recognition igniting in warm browns. At least, it wasn't the teasing smirk and warm glint which was Rory. Instead, it was all Mac. Still twitching as if he was fighting his character for his own mind, Rory dropped the pill onto the carpet and crushed it with his foot before turning to me. And then something stabilised. My castmate, or whatever was left of him, the parts of him still fighting back, trashing the pill, were shoved deep into the crevices of his own mind and his character was bleeding through. Exactly who James wanted him to be. There was the recognition coming to life in another boy's eyes. Sixteen-year-old Mac, who'd been crushing on Katie Parker since middle school. Not twenty-year-old Rory, who swung the other way and would in fact rather eat his own tongue than look at me like that. Hey, 
What are you waiting for? Rory cocked his head. I could see so much put on emotions in that one stare. Longing for the girl he crushed on, as well as the pain of looking at her, knowing she was with another guy. I saw his obsession to keep his youth alive and live every day as his last. It was Mac's character. As well as being a lovable idiot, he was determined to make every day count. I half wondered if all of that had been programmed into the chip, which was currently forcing my friend's brain into compliance. Get dressed. We have school. Staring back at him, I had the sudden urge to punch him square in the face. Maybe that might bring Rory back. But it was too risky. Instead of replying to him, I showered and dressed as normal. That morning, the breakfast was different. Instead of the usual breakfast sandwich, there was a croissant each. Chocolate individually wrapped in expensive-looking paper and what looked like two Starbucks coffees to go. Oh, my mouth watered. I hadn't had anything sweet in what felt like weeks, unless that meant mindlessly chewing on a cupcake during my mediocre break on set. I ate the croissant so fast I barely tasted the explosion of chocolate in my mouth. Combined with the coffee, it was like heaven. When Rory grabbed his and ate it in two bites before gulping down the coffee... The taste went sour in my mouth, and I had to swallow several times to avoid the croissant shooting back up my throat. The unexpected sugary treat for breakfast wasn't an accident. Each breakfast item had been perfectly wrapped, like a gift. It was like a last supper, well, at least for Rory. The sickly feeling followed me to set. It was the same routine. We drove to the set, and I sat with my side pressed to Noah as if being in close proximity to him would somehow change his fate. I was rushed to hair and makeup, and two girls gossiped about a new Netflix show they'd been watching, buzzed around me, transforming me into Katie. My hair was curled into effortless blonde rings, since we're in the midst of a homecoming dance episode, and glitter speckled my cheeks. All the glitter in the world could not hide the dark shadows under my eyes, so they gave up and remodeled my face so I barely recognized myself. We were filming outside that day, and the fall breeze was warm, tickling my bare shoulders. I wore a dress most of the morning and stuck mostly with Noah. I spoke Katie's lines, acting as best as I could, even when I felt like I was shattering apart inside. We had a five-minute break, and I stumbled around the set, trying to find everyone, keeping them in my line of sight, my heart speeding up when James appeared with a crumpled script in his phone. Robin, Noah, and Rory, he spoke up, his voice like a beacon to my castmates. Their heads snapped up from where they'd been awkwardly circling craft services, grabbing finger foods and vanilla puddings stacked on plates. Noah joined me quickly, sliding to my sides. I tried not to think about the times I'd been freaking out about shooting and him grabbing and squeezing my hand. Part of me wanted to reach for his, search for some kind of inclination that he was still there. Doing that, though, would cause suspicion. Following Noah's lead, I copied his nonchalant expression while secretly painting a picture of him in my head. I can write this because I remember him. I want to remember him. I can see him so vividly it hurts. Hair so black against skin so white. Izzy, standing off to the side, standing in a light blue skater dress, perfectly hugging her figure. Strawberry curls flaying in blank eyes I missed. Lana coffee skin and brown hair in two pigtails. Her character Jules was a drama queen. Well, we started the scene normally. Katie was walking to school with Will, already in her homecoming dress, and Mac was supposed to run up to us and ask Katie to the dance. I said my lines as instructed, wondering if they were going to be programmed directly into my head when I finally went through stage four. My wandering thoughts were interrupted when James and Simon, our director, let out a collective sigh. Mr. Gallagher? The writer's expression was stony. He twisted around, glaring at Noah and I, as if we'd personally wronged him. Where the hell is Rory? Here. Turning my head in my castmate's direction, I failed to notice two things. Maybe it was because Noah, for the first time, had followed my gaze instead of looking into oblivion. The first thing I noticed was like a punch to the gut. Rory's accent was back. 
It was broken, splintered in its tone like it didn't belong, but it was back. The second thing I noticed was that, once again, he was twitching. This time his whole face spasming while his shuddering hand grazed his left eye. My castmate was stumbling, staggering, but he was himself. I could tell from the look in his eyes. Terror. That's all I was seeing. Pure, unadulterated terror. What the fuck? Rory spat out. His fingers formed pincers, and he stabbed at his swollen-looking eye, whimpering. What the fuck did you do to me? The crew went silent. And James, for the first time in weeks, looked speechless. You! Managing to find his feet, Rory marched over to the writer until they were face to face. You're a sick bastard. You know that, right? James blinked slowly. Mr. Mr. Gallagher, he spoke calmly. You appear to be off your medication. Rory looked taken aback. You think I'm sick? He hissed. You're the sick one for shoving a razor blade in my freaking eye. What the hell's your problem? Looking around, Rory seemed to notice the rest of us, and he went pale, the fight going from his face. His fingers went back to his right eye. You, you did something to us. He moaned softly, picking at his eyeball. What did you do? What did you do to us? Delusions. James spoke up with a sad shake of his head. It appears Rory is very sick. He must not have been taking his medication. Oh, son, we shouldn't have brought you to set. You should have said something. Rory stared, blinking rapidly. No, he said sharply, his head turning, gaze snapping to each crew member. No, we're not. We're, we're not sick. He backed away, before grabbing Noah and shaking the boy, but Noah was like a doll, limp and expressionless. Noah! Getting increasingly frustrated, Rory slapped the boy across the face, and I felt the sting, but Noah didn't even blink. Hey! My castmate's voice grew hysterical. Don't just stand there. Hey, you're with me, man, right? Noah! Fucking hell, Noah! Noah didn't move, and the pain on Rory's face was enough to kick my brain into gear. What do you do to them? Rory demanded. Fuck, there's something, there's, there's something in my eye. Rory, please calm down. James spoke calmly. Can someone please get a hold of him so he doesn't hurt himself? Thank you. No! My castmate grabbed me, his fingernails stabbing into the bare flesh of my arms. I had to fight back a cry. Robin, he spoke softly. Robs, you're, you're in there, right? I didn't speak. I couldn't speak. I could only watch as Rory was grabbed by a guard. He struggled violently until a needle was thrust into his neck, and he went limp. Oh, my goodness. James shook his head when the guard scooped up the boy, bridal style. Connor, take Mr. Gallagher home, please. I think it's time for the next phase of his treatment. No. My stomach slithered into my toes. All of them, in fact, James continued. Geden, Bright, and Faraday, too. Oh, Harley isn't quite ready. I could only watch as the others were herded away, and a familiar hand grasped onto my arm. I turned to see the same guard who called me Little Bird. He was grinning from ear to ear. His grip tightened. Let's get you home, little Robin, he hummed. The ride back to the hotel was blurry. I think I was crying, uncaring about keeping character and staying hidden behind foggy eyes. When we arrived back to the hotel, my mind started worrying. The car ride had been half an hour, including a gas station stop, where the guard had grabbed himself a cup of coffee and filled the car's tank. My legs were shaking when we entered the hotel lobby, but the guard didn't start heading upstairs. Come along, little bird, he hummed, gesturing for me to follow. He made a face, tapping his pockets. Oh, I've lost my keycard again. I followed him down to the cellar, keeping distance. 
I had to get away. I had to find the others and get them the hell out of this place. Stay, the guard grunted, before slipping inside 305 where the key cards were kept. His expression confused me, the waggling of eyebrows and quirking of lips. Thankful for the distraction, I forced my legs down the same clinical white hallway. 309 was lit up this time, not illuminated in TV static, no actual bright yellow light. From my angle, I saw nobody in the room. My whole body was rattling and I couldn't breathe when I forced myself to slip through the door. I was right, the room was empty, at least of James and his minions. And this, this is where I'm going to struggle with writing. I'll try my best to tell you, but this is the third time I'm writing this part. Every time I try, I can't. Because even if I block out the worst, I still see it. Inside 309 were my castmates. The four of them were in the same state as the videos on Derek's laptop. Plastic masks covered their mouth and nose, but this time their eyes were wide open and unseen. A monitor told me their vitals, and after struggling to free Noah's wrist from the armrest, I found myself at a futuristic-looking control panel. That's what this room was, I thought my fingers grazing each button. James and Derek's secret project. The big red lever was hard not to notice. It was staring at me and my hand was twitching. Seeing my friends like this, vulnerable, strapped down and controlled, it willed me to wrap my fingers around cool metal and wrench the lever downwards. And when the siren started, I knew what I'd done was wrong. My castmates' vitals were screeching, and all four of them had gone into shock, gasping for breath, eyelids flickering, bodies convulsing. I didn't know what to do. I didn't fucking know what to do, so I went to work undoing their restraints. But they weren't looking at me. Their eyes were skyward, and I tried not to notice a cerulean glitter around each iris. A parasite, I thought, my hands going still. When the blood started to run... Crimson against pristine white, the alarm stopped. James ran in, out of breath, but I didn't stop wrenching at Noah's restraints until I was grabbed and dragged back. Robin, the writer let out a hissed breath. Ah, I should have known. Around him, men and women in white were dashing around, attempting to stabilize the others. Ah, I should have known, he cackled again. You are a brilliant actress, after all. His teeth clamped down on my ear, and I let myself cry out. In the corner of my eye, there was so much blood, it ran in tiny rivers, startling claret painting them. James turned my head forcefully. He was out of breath, and I realized the writer was as scared as me. Oh, you better hope and pray you haven't just killed my best stars, he spat, before thundering orders at the crowd of white. Get them cleaned up and initiate a second procedure. But, 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 sir, a young male doctor twisted around, and his expression was panicked. They've just hemorrhaged. If we try again, we could... I don't care, the writer yelled. Do it. You saw them, right? They're around 50% when that little brat shut it down. I'm confident it was just a flux due to the abrupt stop. Marley, the doctor cleared his throat. I wouldn't recommend... The doctor didn't finish his sentence. All around me, vitals were crying out again, and all I was seeing was vacant eyes and blood. Blood. So. Much. Blood. Oh, God. I've killed them. Before I could understand the alarms and panic yelling, James took me upstairs and shoved me in my room. His last words were for me to pray. But that was days ago. All of those blank days that I can't fully remember. All I do remember is James bringing in sheets covered in blood. Part of me recognized them from the ones the others had been laying on in 309. I screamed. I screamed until he slapped me and told me to get a hold of myself. A reminder, James had said, throwing the sheets onto Rory's bed. I asked if the others were okay. And he gave me a long, hard look. 
He brought me food and I ate it. And I stopped thinking, but maybe that was a good thing. I shoved the sheets in the wardrobe. I couldn't look at them. My days became one big confusing blur. At one point my phone disappeared. I found it though. And it's been charged. Funny, I don't remember charging it. I spent most of my day screaming, banging on the door. It feels good to scream again. But nobody's listening to me. Nobody will tell me if my castmates are okay. Earlier, something was shoved through my door. A clear plastic bag with an EpiPen and a yellow sticky note. Robin, I can get you out of here. Take this early tomorrow morning and I'll do the rest. I know trust is not on the cards right now, but I'm your best bet. A friend, if you'd like. This brings me to the end, for now. I need your help. Why would someone give me insulin? Why the specific time? Should I take it, or is this another trick? I'm not thinking straight right now, but do you really think I've killed them? Am I the only one left? If so, why is James still keeping me here? Am I going to die? Well, if this is my last post and I'm turned into Katie or killed, I want you to know who I really am. My name is... The show is... My castmates are... Finally, the bastard who did this to us is... Part 5 I'm becoming my character. Dear Mom, I don't think you'll ever read this, but if there's a small, miraculous chance that you do, I want you to know that I love you. <laughs> That's obvious though, right? Of course I'd say that. I wanted to get that out of the way so I stopped crying like a baby. It's so hard to type right now, but I have to. If I don't, I'll lose my chance to talk to you. Oh, the real reason I'm writing this, in hopes that you someday manage to see it, is that I want you to promise me something. Part of me knows I'm wasting my time. This is going to end up on a random website on the internet. A website that you don't even know exists. The people who've been reading my story will work hard to get this to you, I know that. I also know that it'll never reach you. Because my name is nothing anymore. Even if it means the world to you, the flower you name me after, it's gone. I've tried writing it so many times, and I'm tired. I'm so tired. Every time I put it down, it's blanked out. Like my name is being bled away like the rest of me. You know me as... And I'm holding on to that with everything I have. I will always be... They might be able to take my name from me and blacklist it from every website I can get to. But I know I will forever be... I want you to do something for me. It's small, but it means so much. I want you to notice that I'm gone... I want you to look into my character's eyes on the TV screen and see that something is wrong. When you talk to me on the phone, I want you to question why my voice is different, that I don't sound right. Mom, I want you to grab my shoulders and shake me. I want you to cry. I want you to cry that the girl you're looking at is not your daughter. Because it's not me, Mom. I know it's hard to understand, but you have to ask questions. Be curious. Demand to know why you can barely recognize me. I want you to look into the others. Rory, Izzy, Lana, and Noah. Connect the dots, Mom. You have to find out what happened to us. You have to tell the world what James Marley has done. And once you have, once the truth is out, and the network and TV show have been exposed, I want you to kill me. What you need to understand is that everything that was me, that was from Minnesota, your daughter, is no longer with you. I know it's hard, and I know if you truly do read this, you would never ever do it. You refused to cremate Grandpa, even when that was his last wish before he died. I know you wanted to keep a piece of him. I know you thought that burying him was what was best for Grandpa, because in your words, he can live with the flowers. But you must know that the only thing keeping me kicking right now is the program inside me. James Marley dumped the pieces of me that you love. 
and you can't get them back. And as I write this, I'm crying because I've been in denial that this is really going to happen to me. That I'm going to, well, I don't know. What happens when your consciousness is removed from your body? Do I just cease to exist? Is it the same as dying? Will it be like going to sleep? All those questions have plagued me, Mom. But what I do know is that I'd rather you kill me peacefully so both my body and mind can finally let go. I don't want to be like them, Mom. You have to kill me. It's funny. No, you won't read this. But writing this has made me feel slightly better. Forget everything I just wrote. Forget reality and focus on the fantasy that my life never changed. Nothing bad ever happened to us, I swear. I'm just being dramatic as usual. It's nice to imagine you right now. Julie is probably on your knee. You're watching The Handmaid's Tale. Before my phone was taken away, you were non-stop texting me about it. Now that I think about it, you've probably finished it by now. You've probably sent me multiple texts asking me if I'm eating... If I've met any cute boys or girls? Well, the answer's no, as always. If Rory's still wanting the collectible Pokemon card you found in the attic, yes, I can speak for him and say yes for sure. If Izzy's feelings for no are still there, then I just know you'll be asking Lana to make pumpkin pie for Thanksgiving. To answer those questions, yes... Lana will be making pumpkin pie, and Izzy will make sure to fill you in on the details regarding her infatuation with the completely oblivious Noah. You want to know how we are, right? We're fine. Night shoots are cold and tedious, but we have each other. I'll make sure to tell them to wrap up warm when we visit next month. Well, it's nearly November already. This year has gone so fast. I can't wait to see you. can't wait to see Dad and Julia. Can't wait to stuff my face with your cooking. You're happy, right? At this moment, you're happy, and that's all that matters. I don't want to worry you, I just feel lonely right now. I've come to realise that it's okay to live in blissful ignorance because the truth will most likely break your heart. So here's hoping you haven't read this. Here's hoping you have no idea what's going on. You're still waiting for my calls and texts, and when the show starts, you'll be the first to watch it, nursing a cup of chai tea. Julia will be curled up on your knee, and she won't move until the show is finished. I hope you take one look at the screen and shake your head. Katie Parker will come into shot, and as usual, my name will pop up in the opening credits. She'll be smiling, but you'll fail to see anything left of me. Right, Mum? You'll see it. I know you will. No, you'll say, your eyes widening in confusion. No, that's not her. Please, Mum. I'm begging you, just do one thing for me. Notice. Notice it's not me. Because it's not me, Mummy. It's not me. It's not me. Love... Well, this is going to be my last post, and I'm sorry if it seems rushed and messy, though I'm sure you can give me the benefit of the doubt. I can't write to you anymore. Sorry about that letter. When I'm scared, I go to my mom. When I was a kid, even the smallest of things would send me crying to her. As I grew up, I still used her as a coping mechanism, an anchor. Even before things went to shit and blew up in my face, I would always text my mom if I was sad. Even the little things, like early starts or getting the flu, I always talk to her. I can't express how I feel right now through writing, because numbness is something I don't know how to describe. Fear is something I've come to know well. But for me, it's just sitting here and staring into space. I used to be scared of dying, but I take dying over the inevitable. Anything over this. Allowing James and his army of white to pluck my consciousness from my body. Replacing me with Katie. Sweet Katie. Perfect Katie. The girl next door. The modern Nancy Drew. Katie's loud. Katie counts the clouds and smiles at the moon. She urges me to try and escape. The door is unlocked, Robin. She mutters into the back of my skull. Her voice is scathing, almost teasing. Nothing like I portray her. 
Why don't you try the handle? It's hard to block her out, and it's getting harder. Because as the minutes and hours pass by, I'm starting to subconsciously agree with her. Yes, I guess the moon is beautiful. It's dark outside, and I can see it poking from an expanse of clouds. It rained most of the night, and I followed every drop on the window. Katie hates the rain, so I made sure to memorize and treasure each raindrop. Part of me hopes she'd get tired and leave me alone. Sometimes she does, but all night she's been there, pushing further and further inside my head, sliding into every gap and crevice, spider webbing into my being. That's why I wrote to Mom. Katie's parents are dead. They died when she was four in a total cliché plot device that's well known. A car crash. Ever since then, she's lived with her aunt, and is determined to solve the mystery of why her parents died that night. So, to sever myself from her, I thought about my mum. I had to get it out. I had to talk with my mum for the last time, and I know I can trust you to find her. Maybe don't show her everything. Well, I wrote from my heart, which I know is dangerous. My mum can't know what's happened to me. It'll break her. All I want her to do is notice. I want her to notice that the girl playing Katie Parker is no longer me. That's all I want. Because the voice in my head is getting stronger and I can't stop her. I've tried, believe me. Katie isn't just a phantom presence in the back of my mind anymore. She's a real thing. A tumour eating away at my brain. Memories that I hold close. They're splintering apart piece by piece and all I can do is wait for her to leech onto every piece of me until there's nothing left. And then I began to write. Well, I guess I got carried away. My thoughts are tangled and everything I write looks wrong. It's almost like I'm looking through a foggy mirror. Everything I type looks like I'm writing in a different language. Is that normal? Is this my body's way of telling me it's ready for stage four? Part of me knows where I'm headed, but I don't want to believe it. I want to stay in denial. I don't know how to tell you how scared I am right now, because there's no way to tell you through a phone screen. I feel like I'm repeating myself, but I can't stop. I can't stop writing down the same thought over and over again. I'm scared. I'm so freaking scared. And I don't know how to put it into words. Every time I do, I end up screaming into my knees. I've thrown this phone across the room so many times, but the screen won't break. My body feels wrong. Alien. Every time I move, my head spins and I almost feel drunk. Euphoric. Like the time when Izzy dared me to drink a bottle of straight vodka when we were greenlit for season two. But that was a happy high. A dizzy high. And I don't feel like that. Instead, I feel wrong. Numb. Like my body isn't even mine. My head feels light and strange, but I just want to sleep. But, well, I can't sleep. Not yet. Firstly, I want to start by thanking you once again. To everyone who stuck by me continuing to read this story. I can't thank you enough. It breaks my heart knowing you actually care about me. Not just me, the others too. So I ask you this, even if I don't post anything else, even if it becomes clear that I'm gone, I want you to keep asking questions. Keep demanding to know what's going on. Spread my story on social media, even if it sounds ridiculous. Don't give up on us. Even if we're gone, you have to expose the show. I'm going to try and do my best to tell you who we are without saying our names. We have to track down the others' families. Rory is from a small town in England called Sheffield. His father owns a record store and his mum's an English teacher. Izzy's originally from Mexico. She has a mom and three sisters and they live in Maine. Noah's parents live in New York, as do Lana's. Noah's dad's an author and Lana's mum is a nurse. I know it's not much, but it's all I can think of right now. Promise me you'll find their parents, somehow. And promise me you'll tell them, because I can't. I want to, but I can't. When I think I'm okay, when I think I'm myself, Katie reminds me that I'm not. Okay, I'm going to start for my last update. Not sure when it was. Someone commented that my phone had been tampered with, and you're right. It's not only been charged, but the date has been set to June 3rd, 2008. 
Time is always 12 o'clock. Never moves. So I'm using the passing of day and night to record how much time has passed. It's been days, but I don't know how many. I've been out for most of them, but well, I'll get to that later. The last time I updated you, an EpiPen and a notepad had been pushed under my door. I managed to read the comments, and it was clear to me that the only option I had was to take it. Even if I was scared, paranoid, terrified that it was some kind of trick. I had to take it. Because in my mind, the same thought was plaguing me. It was relentless, screeching inside the back of my head. I'd killed my castmates. While they'd been halfway through the stage four procedure, I'd stopped it. Bringing it to a halt, it killed them. That's all I could think about. It was sending me crazy, hysterical, pacing my room. I couldn't stop looking at Rory's bed. I couldn't stop thinking about the startling claret river running from his nose and mouth. Like a horror movie. His flickering eyes that were skyward. They didn't look at me. They didn't look at anything or anyone. They were soulless, staring into oblivion and endless, empty space. I don't know how long I paced. The EpiPen was clutched in my fist. And I couldn't let go of it. My mind was roaring. Why me? I kept thinking. My heart ached. My lungs felt like they were on fire. Why me and not them? Why was this person so insistent on getting me out? Was it because the others were dead? The note was scrunched up on the floor where I'd thrown it, and the needle in my fist felt more and more prominent, stuck to my clammy palms. Time passed slowly, and I sat on my bed and waited for Rory to come back. Sitting cross-legged like a kid, I waited for the door to open, and James to shove my disgruntled castmate into the room. He'd be okay, I told myself. Maybe he might not be the Rory I knew, but he'd be okay. Rory would climb into bed without saying anything, as usual, and curl into himself like always, burying his head of chestnut curls into lavender-coloured pillows. After several minutes of silence, he'd start snoring, and I ended up shoving my own pillow over my head to block out the noise. Except, no. Rory didn't come back. I was living a fantasy where he was still alive, still living as my roommate, trapped in our own little hell that we shared together. But I still waited, until it became clear to me that he wasn't coming back, that he was downstairs, strapped down, while James Marley emptied him out. Everything that was Rory, my best friend, was gone. The bright red numbers on my bedside clock ticked by, and I stared at the door until my eyes grew heavy. Maybe I could open it with the sheer force of my own mind, was one particularly hysterical thought. The shot was still in my hands. I swallowed bile at the back of my throat. I'd been trapped inside the room for endless hours that bled into night and day, sun and moon. After a while, I started to think about the possibility of getting out. My mind began to weave scenarios in my head, bringing them to life in front of my half-lidded eyes. Escape. It was all I wanted. I could go back to Mom. I could finally wrap my arms around my mother and break apart into her chest. I would tell her everything and she would squeeze me tighter. I'd be safe. I'd be home. One stray thought kept me aware, however. When I was running the point of the pen down my arm searching for a vein... One thought stopped me from shoving the needle in. The others. I couldn't leave them. If they were still alive, if they were still being put through James's torturous experiments, how could I leave them to suffer? They're dead, Robin. Not Katie's voice this time. Mine. My own voice teetering on the edge of my thoughts. Not dead, I thought. Shivers slipping down my spine. My eyes burned, but I couldn't freaking cry. I couldn't cry, and I couldn't stand it. No. Not dead. Worse. I don't know what possessed me to use the EpiPen. There was a pinch, followed by a sharp sting. Though I barely noticed the point sliding in. Maybe it was the haunting memory of Rory coming back to startling awareness. The terror in his eyes when he grabbed my shoulders, violently shaking me. His voice was still there. A phantom cry. Fuck. I remember stamming it in again. 
harder while his voice danced around the back of my mind, bleeding into me. I felt him. I felt all of him coming to life inside me. Robin? The slur of his English accent that rolled off his tongue sparked something inside me. Robs, you're still in there, right? Yes, I wanted to scream. Yes, I'm here. I didn't reply. Rory had been awake. He'd been awake and I had done nothing. I couldn't. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. My castmate was begging me with his eyes to respond, but the words were caught in my throat. I could have done something. I could have given up my facade and stand with him. It wasn't much, and the likelihood of getting away was slim. And with that thought, the memory of myself standing there, still, numb, just staring back at him, well, something hit me, a tumultuous wave of ice water. I dug the pen in deeper, biting my lip against a cry. The needle slicing into my skin was barely noticeable. Instead, it was the memory that was killing me. Tipping my head back, I squeezed my eyes shut trying to focus on the peeled paint on the ceiling. I was seeing Rory stumbling into a guard's arms, unsteady on his feet, warm browns wide, lips twisted. He wasn't looking at me when the guard thrust a needle into the flesh of his neck. Rory was staring at Noah. His expression had been twisted, confused, terrified. Noah, what the hell are you doing? Snap out of it. But we could have run. I could have grabbed his arm and run. I could have fucking run. Why didn't I? Why did I just stand there? Why did I let him take him? After hiding the empty pen as well as the note in the bag, I crawled back into bed with my arms stinging, forcing myself not to look at the other side of the room. Oh, I would not think about Rory. Laying back, I found myself in the fetal position, pressing my face into my covers. I don't know how long I lay there. I don't remember falling asleep, only waking. Of course I did. My body was shaking so hard that I rolled off my bed, landing on the carpet with an audible thump. At first I thought it was an earthquake, but it wasn't the room that was convulsing. It was me. I couldn't move. My mouth was open and I was screaming. At first I didn't notice it. My trembling body was enough to send my thoughts into a tailspin, and I wondered if this was it. Maybe they were planning to get rid of me. Maybe they didn't need Katie Parker. If the others were dead, they wouldn't need me, right? Killing me would make sense. The show would release some bullshit story that all five of us had gotten into a car collision or overdosed on Class A's. But then I realized my body was burning. There was fire in my veins and I was screeching. I couldn't stop myself. My limbs were dead weight and I couldn't open my eyes. All I could do was burn, thrashing side to side, my head spinning itself off its axis. The door flew open. I was aware of that. Panic footsteps ran through and two pairs of hands lifted me from the ground. But I was still shaking, and I was still screaming. Robin, dear God, what the hell is going on? James. His voice was a sharp hiss, and I sensed fear in his tone. I couldn't open my eyes. I couldn't stop screaming even when I tried to swallow it down. It crept back up like vomit. I felt myself hanging from someone's embrace. My head wouldn't stay up and the sickly stink of James's cologne drifted into my nose when he leaned in close. She's barely responsive, he shouted over my screams. Get her downstairs. Voices flooded my mind. They sounded like they were underwater. I sedate her. Marley! What happened to her? Oh, this stupid brat probably had an allergic reaction. Can someone please get her medical records now? The last thing I need is Katie Parker's body giving up on us. Life flickered in and out of focus. I felt myself being lifted into warm arms. I was carried, my arms hanging limp. I stopped screaming when something cold sliced into my wrist. The fire was put out, and instead there was warmth which filled my body. I felt multiple hands on me, prodding and poking, needles and tubes being stuck into me. I stopped shaking and found sleep. Finally, sleep. The type of slumber I'd missed. Life came back to me in the form of a hard slap across the face. 
Miss Harley. James's voice. As usual, it was cruel and grating. Open your eyes for me, sweetheart. There's a good girl. There was impatience in his tone, and my body was already responding to his voice. My eyes flickered open. I was greeted with bright white light glaring down at me. There was something protruding inside my nose. Something plastic. Something I wanted to rip away. But when I tried to, I found my wrists restrained to the bed I was lying on. Panic settled in, but whatever words I was trying to coerce on my tongue were interrupted by James's chuckle. Hmm. <laughs> Finally. I swiveled my eyes to him. He was standing over me, arms folded, smiling. There was a twist in his lips. Dear God, Robin, we nearly lost you. No, I thought, curling my lip. They'd nearly lost Katie. I didn't say that, though. His expression told me to stay quiet, obedient. So I did. Forcing my gaze away from his twinkling eyes, I automatically began searching for my castmates. But the room was different. It wasn't 309, and there was no sign of any of them. Miss Harley? A voice that sounded like wind chimes made me jump, and a young nurse appeared next to James. She looked around my age, maybe older. Her hair was pulled back into a ponytail, mocha skin glistening under sickly yellow lights. Her smile was kind, but I ignored it. The woman leaned forward, and I tried to move back, but was obstructed by the mountain of pillows cushioning my head. Robin, my name is Dr. Carlyle. I work with your producer. Honey, you've been asleep for a few days, so try and take it easy. What? The word was tangled in my mouth. I couldn't spit it out. A few days? Something inside me snapped, and I lunged against the restraints, my eyes stinging. I'd been asleep for days, oblivious of what they were doing to the others. When I glanced at James, his lips formed a smirk. He looked triumphant, and my heart slithered into my gut. He cocked his head. You look surprised. Shaking my head, I swallowed hard. Dr. Carlyle's lips were pursed. She gently pushed me back onto the bed. We're not quite sure what happened to you, so we'll be monitoring you for the next few hours, okay? She laughed lightly. You've scared us quite a bit. Mm, indeed. James jumped in, impatient to move things along. When will you be discharging her? Dr. Carlyle straightened up. Very soon. She smiled brightly at the writer, before clearing her throat. Oh, uh, Mr. Marley, would I be able to have a private word with Robin? I'd like to ask her a few questions regarding her medical records. James shrugged. Sure. He sent me a wink before practically dancing away. Get well soon, Robs. His words were casual, but the look on his face was teasing. He was waiting for me to break, using Rory's last words as a weapon. I stiffened. Shivers ripped up and down my spine, and I had to fight against a cry. Dr. Carlyle buzzed around me like a moth to a flame, and I let her prod and poke me, checking the IV sticking in my wrist. When the door slammed shut, I noticed her posture change. The light smile on her lips curved into a frown, and something in her eyes lit up. Suddenly her hands were on mine, gripping my fingers and squeezing tightly. It was almost motherly, but I snatched my hand back, tugging against the Velcro straps. I wasn't even sure if you were going to wake up, the doctor said softly. Her wide blue eyes were sincere, and she slowly began to undo the restraints, pinning down my wrists. Daniel gave you the wrong dose, she tutted, shaking her head. My God, he nearly killed you. But don't worry, okay? Her fingers worked quickly, pulling me free. I'm going to get you out of here. For a moment, I was speechless, before words started to pop out of my mouth. My mind snapped back to the note, the EpiPen. You're... She interrupted me with a shaky laugh. A friend, yes. Dr. Carlyle worked quickly, pulling out the needles attached to my arms, the tubes inserted into my nose. 
You'll have to forgive our mistake, Robin. The plan was to recreate a mild allergic reaction, a prototype of mine, but um, my partner messed up the dose. Sitting up, I rubbed my arms. I couldn't speak. The doctor shoved something rubber into my mouth. Bite down on this, okay? Why? I was shaking with adrenaline. I was free. Every instinct inside me was screaming at me to look for the others, but Dr. Carlyle's stare kept me glued to the bed. Miss Harley, I know you're scared, she said softly. Believe me, if I was you, the last thing I would do is trust anyone in this horrific place. Her hand grasped for mine once more. This time I let her take it. I can help you, she said. But you're going to need to cooperate with me, okay? We haven't got much time, and your producer is an impatient man. Nodding robotically, I let her take my arm. She shoved the rubber thing into my mouth, and I bit down hard. Dr. Carlyle smiled, but her eyes were haunted. I noticed her hands were shaking too, her gaze flicking back and forth, searching for intruders. I need you to close your eyes and try not to scream, all right? You have to make as little noise as possible. Just hold it in, honey. Okay, I whispered. My eyes flickered shut, and within moments of staring into the backs of my eyelids, something sharp. Something cold and cruel had sliced into my arm. I jolted, biting down harder. Dr. Carlyle's voice was strained. Almost there. I felt something metal, something sharp, digging into the incision. And that time I did scream. When I opened my eyes, she was panting and a pool of red was dripping down my left arm. Dr. Carlyle was holding something up to the light and I peered at it. Tracking device. Pinched between a pair of tweezers in her hand was what looked like a grain of rice. Dr. Carlyle pulled a face. Inhumane, she muttered, flinging it behind her. I was pulled off the bed quickly, the doctor's arms helping me across the room. We need to hurry, Robin, she said in a gasp of breath. But I wasn't listening to her. My body was moving on its own and I was tearing myself out of her grip. Staggering without her support, I forced myself to stay upright, scanning the room for any sign of the others. There was another bed at the corner of my eye. Hidden behind a white curtain, there was a body-sized lump lying on top of it, covered by light blue hospital linen. Something inside me urged me closer. Before I knew what I was doing, I was grasping hold of the cloth and pulling it back. The first thing I saw was... white. I saw chipped, pearly white, and slithers of light pink. It took me a moment to realize what I was looking at, before I gagged. My whole body trembled and I gasped out, slipping to my knees. I was dry heaving, my body struggling to process what was in front of me. I was screaming, gasping for air, but no sound was coming out. Dr. Carlyle grabbed me, wrapping her arms around me and forcing my head into her shoulder. Robin. Her voice sounded faded. Wrong. My mouth was working, but the scream clawing at my throat wasn't hitting the sound barrier. Listen to me. She was hissing, and her hands were working to stroke my hair, flitting her fingers through my ponytail. It's not them. Her voice was steady, but it sounded like she was crying too. But my ears were roaring. The world was spinning, and I felt faint. Robin. I want you to look closer, okay? Even if you don't want to, just look closer. And then, I promise you, you'll never have to see it again. I'm going to get you away from here. Her words drove me to some kind of understanding. My body worked on its own and I was swiveling around, expecting the worst. But when I properly looked, I saw only the face of Derek Marley. His eyes were skyward, staring at the ceiling... But his head had been sliced cleanly open, exposing chip skull and brain bleeding through cracked trauma. Not any of the others, not Noah or Rory, Lana or Izzy. No, what I was looking at was what was left of James's brother. You need to listen to me. Dr. Carlyle's voice was firm, her grip on my arm like a vice. I let her drag me towards the exit door. 
James Marley is a sick man. His brother was another of his failed experiments. But you need to listen to me, and listen good, okay? He would never murder his top stars. His plans for you are horrific, Robin, but he would never go that far. You five are the reason why he has a career in the first place. She was right, but that didn't stop my gaze going to the medical waste trash can near the corner. Rory's khaki shirt, the one he'd been wearing the day he was taken away, was poking from clear plastic. The material was dyed a vicious shade of red, and I shook my head, twisting myself away. Dr. Carlyle must have followed my gaze. She let out a soft breath. We need to go. Unresponsive, I let her pull me from the room. Once we were back on the hallway, the doctor pulled out blue scrubs and a face mask. Put these on, quickly. Tuck your hair under this. She handed me a cloth cap. Doing what I was told, I threw on the tight, light blue ensemble, and then the face mask over my mouth and nose. And finally, the cap. Dr. Carlyle grabbed my arm. Don't speak, she said sternly. Don't make a noise, just stay silent and let me do the talking. Her words confused me until we were back in the hotel lobby. The clerk was behind the desk as usual. Each TV mounted to the wall was still playing reruns of the show. But what was different was a beefy looking guard standing at the door. I put my head down, glaring into the sickly yellow carpet. Dr. Carlyle approached the guard, pulling me with her. Rosie, the guard's voice grunted. Dr. Carlyle, or Rosie, squeezed my arm tighter, almost as if to reassure me. Mark, her voice was bright. I've been told to escort Dr. Matthews home. She's got a raging temperature and a cough. She's also quite delirious on medication I've administered. Oh, the guard hissed a curse under his breath. Do you mean, uh, yes? Well, shit, he groaned. Can you get her to remove her mask to confirm my identity? That won't be necessary. Dr. Carlyle managed to keep her cool, while I broke out into a cold sweat. The protocol is that we get them out of here as soon as possible to avoid an outbreak. The show is behind schedule already. We need to be careful. The guard hummed. Mm, right, of course, go. We started forwards, but the guard stopped us, shoving us back. What's wrong with her arm? I froze. The blood from the incision must have bled through my scrubs. Oh, she caught it on one of the old doors, Dr. Carlyle said. Now, please excuse us. I should really get Dr. Matthews home. My breath caught when I felt the cool graze of wind on my face. We were outside, but I couldn't be relieved yet. Dr. Carlyle was panting, practically stumbling over the gravel pathway. Do not look up, she said softly. We're almost there, Robin. My bare feet moved over concrete before car doors were opening and I was being helped into the front seat. The engine came to life, the radio sputtering a news station. I still didn't look up, glaring between my knees. My fingers gripped at plush leather, squeezing for dear life. When the car started forwards, the knot in my gut loosened slightly. When I risked a glance up, her hand whipped out to shove my head back down. Not yet. I have to do something first. Nodding, I stayed silent. To distract myself, I listened to the radio, but all I heard was static. And when I thought of static, all I could think of was the ancient Looney Tunes cartoons turning Noah's brain inside out. When Dr. Carlyle stopped the car, and when windows on her side slid up, my chest clenched. I pressed my face into my lap. Idiot, Dr. Carlyle spoke up. But she wasn't speaking to me. Her voice had gone cold, splintering ice. How many times did I tell you to check the dose? A light male laugh startled me. Relax, Rosie. It did the job, didn't it? Dr. Carlyle tutted. One of the doors at the back opened with a mechanical whine, and something heavy hit the seats. I didn't dare look up. The door slammed shut, and Dr. Carlyle's seat squeaked when she twisted to look at whatever had been thrown in. The debt's paid, Rose, the man grunted, 
Take him and get him as far away from here as possible. I know a guy who can get you through the border, no questions asked. Isn't the border closed? Dr. Carlyle sounded skeptical. Yeah, it is, but like I said, I know a guy. Give him my reference number. I'll text it to you on the burner. Right. The doctor cleared her throat. Oh, I think you're missing something, Dan. The man, Dan, cursed under his breath. You know what they'll do to me. Hand it over. We had a deal. Dr. Carlyle's voice was firm. I looked up only to glimpse a figure outside the window. His identity was shrouded in darkness. He reached into his jacket and pulled something out before handing it to Dr. Carlyle, who reached for it. Is this it? Her voice broke slightly. Yep, just done this afternoon. The man let out a heavy sigh. That son of a bitch needs locking up. Poor kids. Stop. That word burned on my tongue and my eyes stung. Don't feel sorry for us. Did you make sure to get the tracker out? The stranger laughed. You think I'm stupid? Of course I did. Tracker? I struggled to keep my head down now. Who was he talking about? Me? Thank you, Daniel. Dr. Carlyle paused. You do realize you're saving these kids, right? The man scoffed. Yep. And sacrificing myself. When we left Dr. Carlyle's partner... I still couldn't bring myself to lift my head. I waited in tense silence until we'd driven at least three blocks before I risked looking up. The sky was dark, but I felt a rush of relief that flooded through my body. I was free, and yet my heart still ached. Oh, call me Rosie, by the way, Dr. Carlyle said casually, gripping the steering wheel. I noticed something black and sleek stuck to her right hand. She was holding onto it for dear life. The woman sent me a glance. It's okay. You can relax now. She gestured to the road ahead. We've got about three hours until we reach the border, so maybe get some sleep. But I didn't want sleep. I wanted answers. I turned in my seat, curious to see what had been thrown onto the back seats. But to my horror, I found myself staring at Noah. My castmate was dressed in the light blue scrubs and the same face mask, which had slipped from his mouth and nose. Strands of his raven hair bled from the cap over his head, and a blindfold had been wrapped around his eyes. I lost my breath. Leaning forward, I pressed a shaking hand on his shoulder, expecting the worst. But he was breathing. Noah was breathing. His body was curled up, his legs tucked into his chest. My castmate's name was choked in my sandpaper throat. Noah's eyes were covered. I thought, why were his eyes covered? Robin, don't look back there. Finally finding my voice, I felt brave enough to coerce actual words out. Noah. Rosie sighed. Yes, that is him, but right now he's in quite a state. When you disrupted the level 4 programming, the procedure was stopped at 50%. She reached forward and flicked the radio off, leaving us in silence. The doctor shuffled uncomfortably in her seat, her gaze on the road. Since then, there's been no activity for Keaton or the program. All four of them are at a standstill, and I took the opportunity to get as many of you out as possible. But... but... I choked again. It was like she could read my mind, cutting me off. Daniel was supposed to get Gallagher too, since he's hanging by a thread, but it seems he only managed Keaton. Hanging by a thread. Rory was hanging by a thread, but he was still alive. He was still him. Oh, I could only hope. Before I could speak, she was continuing. Luckily, Rosie waved the black object in her hand. It was a USB drive. I know someone who is as smart as Derek knows the procedure. What I'm hoping for is some kind of reversal process, but I'm not counting on it. I want to focus right now on waking the kid up. Then we can start thinking about figuring out how the hell we're going to transfer living consciousness back into the brain, which is way beyond anything I've ever studied. She let out a choked laugh. And, well, I'm a goddamn neurologist. Rosie glared at the road ahead. 
Cars flew by, headlights blinding. This isn't science. It's playing God. One look at the flash drive in Rosie's hand sent prickles of ice down my spine. I sat up straighter in my seat. Is that... The words wouldn't come. The doctor nodded grimly. Yes, Noah Keaton's core consciousness is inside here. She pulled a face. At least, I hope so. I guess we'll know if Daniel played us. Ignoring her, I turned in my seat and grasped for Noah's hand. It was cold, but it felt right in mine. It wasn't much, not anything really, because Noah wasn't there anymore. But I still wanted to hold him. I still wanted to pretend that he was there. Rosie must have seen my expression because she sighed. You have no idea how many people are funding Daffodil, Robin. James may be the head of the project, but a lot of people are willing to do anything to make sure there's an end result, which is all five of you being successful subjects. I know exposing those bastards is most likely on your mind, but first we have to think logically, okay? Subjects? Chills ran down my spine. I'm not even an actress anymore. I'm a test subject. A host for a fictional character. And she was right. As much as I wanted to go back to my family, I was putting them at risk. We had to focus on Noah first, and then getting the others out. And then I'd tell the world. Sleep, Rosie said, when I finally let go of Noah's hand. You look exhausted. Her smile was kind. I'll be here when you wake up, I promise. Tell me if you need anything. I didn't think I'd be able to sleep in a car, with the empty shell of my castmate slumped on the back seats. But I did. I didn't dream, though. I just floated, and it was peaceful. The sweet aroma of coffee woke me up, and I blinked to find Rosie waving a Starbucks latte under my nose. Automatically, Noah's name was on my lips, and my chest was heaving. Ignoring the coffee being held out to me, I nearly gave myself whiplash, turning to see if Noah was still there. He was. Rosie had thrown a patterned blanket over him. Relax, the doctor murmured when I faced the front and took the coffee, swallowing it down. It burned my mouth, but I didn't care. Keaton isn't going anywhere. I asked where we were, and Rosie hummed. We passed through the border when you were asleep. We should be here in about twenty minutes, so feel free to get some more shut eye. For the first time in weeks, I felt relaxed. I felt safe. The second time I slipped into slumber, it was longer, darker, and this time I dreamed. I dreamed countless dreams, and when I woke, I was no longer in Rosie's car. Oh, I'm sorry I'm going to struggle writing this. It's weird. The words have gone blurry. Flickering light blinded me when I opened my eyes. Pristine white walls. I couldn't move my arms, I couldn't move at all. First I was disoriented, but as my vision cleared I realized the flickering light in front of me was a TV screen. The room was dark except for the screen. I glimpsed Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck through flitting static. It was the same sequence playing over and over again, just like the one I'd seen Noah watching. It was different than when I'd seen it first. Back then, it was just a cartoon, just scrambled images bouncing through static. I almost understood why Noah couldn't keep his eyes off of it. There was something there, underneath the cracking and hissing. Something was pushing its way through, and I felt it. I felt it crawling its way inside my mind. Tearing my gaze from the television, I noticed my restraints were loose. With one tug, I was free, lunging off of the bed. My head was pounding, my stomach was rolling, and every so often my trembling hand would graze my right eye, stabbing at sore skin. How long had I been asleep? The question burned at the back of my mind. More importantly, how long had I been exposed to the cartoon? Where was I? I definitely wasn't at the hotel. The room I was in was bigger, built more like an operating theatre. On the way to the door I tripped over something... When I looked down to see who it was, 
I had to slap a hand over my mouth to stop from crying out. Rosie. The nurse who had helped me was lying in a halo of dark curls. There was a single bullet hole in the middle of her forehead. She was holding something, but part of me already knew what it was. The flash drive with Noah's consciousness. I didn't waste time. Stuffing the flash drive in my jeans pocket, I searched for Noah. Rosie had taken us to somebody's house, which looked to be high-tech. It was built more like a facility. A long, white hallway led me to another large room. The same dentist chair contraption was inside, and strapped to it was Noah, who was no longer an empty shell, slumped across the back seat of Dr. Carlyle's car. No, Noah was awake. His eyes were open, half-lidded. He was stiff in the chair, and when I moved towards him, he shook his head rapidly, backing into the headrest. There was a tube in his left arm, and my eyes followed it to a machine next to him. It was pumping some kind of clear fluid inside him. Well, seeing him alive flooded me with adrenaline. Noah! I spoke with the gutter of my throat. This time there was no cartoon twisting his mind into submission. My castmate shook his head and I was reminded of the flash drive in my pocket. Suddenly, it was so hard to swallow. I had to back myself away, but dug my foot into the floor. Will? The boy stared back. He didn't nod, but there was a glimmer of cerulean light in his eyes, the same light I'd seen back in 309. All I wanted to do was get out of there, Seeing my friend's body occupied with a fictional character was setting my nerve endings on fire. I had to get out. But then, tapping. Noah, or Will, was still looking at me. His eyes were blank, but his fingers were tapping and scratching at the armrest under his restraints. I knew what to do. Grabbing a roll of toilet paper and a scalpel from a tray of silver instruments, I struggled to keep up with his fingers that were faster than Noah's, more precise. Yeah, they danced across plush leather like he was playing the piano. It looked like Noah, or Will, was going to tap out something else. His fingers hovered and I waited for him to do it. But a voice sliced cleanly through the silence. Mr. Marley, contacted you as soon as I could. It was a man's voice, grouchy, old. My feet were glued to the spot. Behind me, the thing inside my castmate didn't move. But his eyes, swimming with blue light, had widened. Yes, both of them. Keaton has been finalized. I was able to revive his mind and repeat the procedure, successfully complete in stage four. He's stable as of now, and I'm monitoring him. Somehow my legs managed to work. I inched towards the door, holding my breath. The man was right outside. I trust you've had problems with Gallagher. Eh, bring the boy here. It's only a matter of simple surgery, James. It's not rocket science. Oh, I don't care if he's had a head injury. Conditioning is still possible. Like I said, leave him with me, and he'll be right as rain. Yeah, it's the Brit right. Something was said on the other end of the line, and the man snorted. Harley. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. She's been inserted, yes. Just a matter of waiting for the program to take hold, naturally. And then, of course, I'll be putting her through stage four. I knew what that meant. Oh, I can't put exactly what I felt at that moment into writing. It all made a sick kind of sense. My pounding head and the foggy feeling that had begun to envelop my mind. I couldn't breathe. 
suffocated. I, I felt suffocated. Yes, Marley, the man grunted. Tomorrow, you bring the deviant and I'll give you two spanking new characters for your shitty show. After that, after my fate was given to me, everything went blurry. I don't remember getting caught. I don't remember him dragging me by my hair up countless flights of steps, muttering that I didn't matter. All he wanted was my body. All he wanted was my face. I was thrown into a room which reminded me of my character's bedroom. The walls were light purple, the bedspread matching. The rug was fluffy under my bare feet. There was a potted daffodil on the windowsill. I grabbed it, hurling it at the wall. There was nobody I could cry out to. The windows were locked. When I looked outside, the sky was dark again. I don't know how many dark skies have passed. All I know is that I'm not getting out of here. None of us are. Noah, Lana, and Izzy are gone. Rory is close to losing himself. I don't know how far he is. I don't know if he's himself, or a shell like Noah. I guess this is it. I don't want to stop posting, but I don't think I have a choice anymore. Katie is killing me. She's right here, bleeding into everything I am. Oh, I'm tired. I want my mom. God, I just want my mom. You understood me earlier, right? What I wrote... I meant it. You have to find the other's parents. Tell them what happened to their kids. Tell them everything. Translate Noah or his character's message to me. Maybe you can figure out what he was trying to say. I don't know if Rosie was using a fake name, but try hers. <laughs> try everything. Rosie Carlyle. Her name is Rosie Carlyle. If you have to, show people of this. I'm going to try one more time. My name is... My castmates' names are... Do you hear me? My name is... This is a message from... Studios. Everything above, as well as the four other posts on this account, are a work of fiction. The social experiment on this platform performed by our lovely Robin Harley over a five-week period in an attempt to garner attention for the return of our show at the start of 2021... We hope you enjoyed it. Please do not take any of this seriously. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to visit Robin's Instagram, where you can find the details of the promotion on there. Like and comment on Robin's most recent post with your favorite character in the show, and you could get an exclusive virtual meet and greet with the stars of... Don't forget to catch Season 3 of... Starting this January... Starring Rory Gallagher, Noah Keaton, Robin Harley, Izzy Bright, and Lana Faraday. Only on... So there you go, boys and girls. Uh, took me a bit of time, but, well, of course it did. Three and a half hours, <laughs> end product. Took me several days to get that recorded, um, edited done and dusted, and I hope you think it was worth it. Oh, what an incredible story that was. Uh, far-fetched? I hope so. I hate to think of that going on in real life, but who knows. And if you did enjoy it, well, it does look like the author is planning a follow-up epic as well, so there could be more of that to come if you play your cards right. Well, enough for one evening, but I'll be back again on my other channel tomorrow with the latest edition of the podcast. Um, if you're not subscribed, please go to wherever it is you get your podcast from and look at the links in the description and sign up. Give me a bit of support, okay? Uh, taking a bit of time to get going, but I think it's worthwhile. It's just another way for me to uh, get my stories out to you. Well, enough for one day, but I'll be back again, like I said, very soon. Uh, something else very special for you here on Friday. So, till the next time, very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, 
Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.